Hello everybody, James here, WSI, my guest this week, former WWF and WCW Tag Team Champion all the way from Nastyville. There he is, Brian Nobbs. Good morning What's to you, up, man. What's up, James? Good morning. How are you doing? It, almost, it's almost noon here, so, you know, we're almost 12 o'clock, so that's a good thing. Well, that was, uh, do you know, I just went, good morning, and then I looked at the clock and went, morning. There you go. You're seven more minutes. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, hey, got one of my uh, new Nasty Boy shirts on. You can get them at Pro Wrestling Tees, you know. I mean, if you can see it back there, but uh, we're ready to rock and roll here. I heard you had some good questions for me, and... Uh. Uh, I love the people over there in Europe and England, and uh, man, one of the best places to go. We, uh, I think it was last year, we were at the uh, the Love of Wrestling in Liverpool, and we had we signed so many autographs for so many people and so many stories. I mean, we love it over there. I mean, we really do. Yeah, how come you weren't in Manchester? Because I'm in Manchester, so you weren't here this yeah, year. I, yeah, I don't know why they uh, we we flew into Manchester and then they always have it at Liverpool. I don't know, uh, you know. And then uh, we were supposed to come back. I think it was last year for that Tyson Fury thing, and then something got screwed up that, because he had like a si autograph signing with everybody, and I think he had Bret Hart over there and that, and then. Uh, uh, Mickey James and uh, uh, her her husband was over there also, mm -hmm. and we talked about that. And that that kind of they didn't have everything together yet. They were trying to, you know, they didn't have the the system down yet. You know, like that uh, for the love of wrestling, man. They they have everything boom, boom, boom. You know, they have everybody lined up right, and you know, so it doesn't get too clustered. Yeah, uh, I've uh, interviewed quite a few people recently over where you are now. You know, demolition and the warlord and some other guys right. like that, and they're all saying, dude. I We've never been so busy since we were, you know, back on the WWF road in 91 or something like that. Are you just constantly right. doing the conventions, keeping yourself busy? Uh, yes. and But I was out there for a while because I went through a lot of health issues here in the last four or five years. And mm -hmm. like I said, I thank the fans. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts and your prayers. And, and even when my buddy put me up a GoFundMe page, some people sent me some money and, and everything helped. I mean, all of it together, and everybody always had positive stuff to say, and uh, that kept me going, man. That positivity, and you know, keep on going, and uh, I'm back, and I'm back signing and rolling again. So here we are, you nasty know, as ever, nasty boy. I'm nasty as ever. I'm still here. <laughs> oh, you know, they had this, they had this crazy thing I called the wrestlers' death list, and I've been on that thing for thirty years, and I'm still here. So. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> Dude, uh, Hulk, just, Hulk, Hulk Hogan said you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's decreed it, has he? He's like, you're not going anywhere, brother. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's he spirit. says nobody wants you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, just speaking of your health, because I was asking just beforehand how you were doing, you yeah. said, oh, well, you know, a lot better than in 2021, because I know you had to go full right. me. Uh, so what have you overcome in the last two years health-wise to get to where you are now? Uh, you know, just a lot of stuff I had to watch, you know, uh, uh, first of all, drink and I cut that out. Now I started drinking a couple of beers here and there again. And, you know, and then my doctor said, you know, I saved your life almost four times already. And then I looked at the doc and said, well, you might have to make it five or six. I'm a pro wrestler. You know how we are, but, uh, you know, and it just everything else, you know, just, uh, uh, just all the being on the road for 40 years and the lifestyle we lived and the, and the injuries uh, plus knee replacements I need and shoulder replacements. And, you know, you, you just get sick of being in the hospital after a while. So right now I need a knee replacement on my right side and I need a shoulder replacement, but that puts you out again for four months at a time. And I can't do that. I got to get out there and, and try to make some money now, you know, cause there is no pension plan in pro wrestling. <laughs> hey, no, absolutely. I, well, I was going to save this for later, but uh, are you on like a legends deal with WWE or anything like that? Oh, uh, we, uh, yes, we're on a, a legends deal and we've been, on a legends deal for a while and uh you know that's that's one good thing you know there's nothing like the wwe uh they're, they're you know AEW is good but uh you know wwe is the best uh you know we we still know it as the wwf but uh you know they, they still really you know uh have their have everything together i mean if you want to go somewhere if you're a pro wrestler what you really want to do in life is make it to a WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. and if you could be as lucky as us and be in a championship match at WrestleMania and win the belts, then you're really gold, you yeah. know? So so we get, we had that happen to us. So uh, we were very fortunate and lucky and honored to, you know, have to be in the position we were in and uh, to have the training, you know? Uh, it all comes with training, and we got trained by the right people. 
Uh, you know, we went up to Vern Gagne's camp in Minnesota, and uh, that's where we started training. And, uh, you know, we started with 22 guys, and me and Sag were the only ones to survive because we lived on the bottom of Brad Reagan's house, and he was an <laughs> Olympic uh, bronze medal winner, and then he beat the Russian in the World Games in 79 for the gold medal, but then we boycotted the 80 Olympics, and then he went to pro wrestling, and he was uh, Vern Gagne's, you know, uh, trainer. So we were actually wrestling like a, a Olympic style because the, the wrestling ring didn't even come out for three months. We were getting tortured. So, but like I said, we lived on the bottom of Brad where the camp was and our car broke down. So we were stuck. <laughs> we, there was no way we could quit. We had nowhere to go. We were in <laughs> Minnesota. So we were there. And then, you know, after we went through, I, I would say about six months of training, uh, then we went, drove the ring truck for about four or five, six months. We didn't get in the ring for about a year after we even trained. But that's all how they used to do things back in the day. You know, so all about respect and learning the business. And, uh, you know, it went a long way. Do you know, uh, because I said before, I'm having to split, you know, because we got like, what did I say? 250 questions, something yeah, crazy yeah. like that. So, right. you know, I'm saving some for uh, SAGs. I'm saving some right. for you, obviously. Right. And I've had to be, I've had to be a bit ruthless of the questions I've had to cut out. But one thing I do want to know is, mm. is that until today, I hadn't realized he had about a six month run in memphis and when did a you, year was it a full year oh, yeah 1987 yeah how did you get called over to memphis and was it a bit of a uh we got shock? fired from the awa <laughs> <laughs> uh we almost supposedly burned down a hotel and it was called the western ho in grand forks north dakota but it wasn't our fault, of course, and our mentor at the time was none other than Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, mm -hmm. and he joked a lot, and, uh, you know, we pulled a lot of jokes and a lot of ribs, so, uh, yes, uh, some things happened, and, of course, the young guys got blamed, so uh, Wahoo and uh, McDaniels and uh, and Ray Crippler Stevens were the bookers, and uh, we got fired over that incident, and then a week later, Wahoo called us and said, hey, you two assholes, I got your job <laughs> down in Memphis. They want you down there, be down there in a, in a week, and they're going to use you. And that's how we got, you know, that's how we started Memphis. That's how we got hired down there. So uh, you used the word allegedly there. So what were you uh, uh, alleged to have done? Uh, we almost burned down the hotel in uh, Grand Forks. Well, they had an outside hotel, and then... Uh, Kurt and Wahoo were going at it because Kurt uh, Wahoo was the booker and Kurt didn't like, I guess, the way they were, they were using him or something. So Kurt banged on the door and we were in the back of his SUV and we had two of these 50 Roman candles apiece and Kurt lit them and knocked on the door and Wahoo and Ray were staying together. And when Wahoo opened the door, the the, the, the Roman candle balls were shooting in there. It was like fireworks in their room, like the 4th of July. About four of them hit Wahoo in the head and the chest. He could have slammed the door. And, and supposedly we almost got burned down, you know, burned down the, the hotel and we got blamed for that. And somebody, there was a, a, a wrestler by the name of Mitch Snow and he was one of their up and coming baby faces and he lost his eyebrows. Uh, somebody shaved his eyebrows off. So yeah, we got blamed for that too. So that was one of the reasons uh, we got uh, moved <laughs> down the, uh, the AWA. So that was the first time. <laughs> it would have to have happened to the bookers as well, wouldn't it? What's that? It would have had to have been, you know, fireworks in the Booker's room, of course. Oh yeah, well yeah, it was shooting right in raisin, raisin, <laughs> right in raisin, Wahoo's room. They were staying together. Oh yeah, before he could shut the door, there was a, there was about about twenty of them fire, all different colors, flying off in their room. Like I said, it was the Fourth of July in their, in their room because <laughs> it was an outside room. You know what I mean? So you open it up, and you know we did we did we did something like that in Japan with uh, Lord Regal, but we did it in the hallway. Oh, we got big heat for that too. Yeah, we oh. so we shut fireworks off. Yeah, we were we were stupid back then, but uh, we were young and crazy. What can you say? Hey, you un know? unbelievably, that may come up a bit later. William Regal did. Ha there is a story about William Regal here later on. Uh, okay. Before uh, we before we get off Memphis, so you get to Memphis, yeah. you're there for you know a year or good enough a year. Uh, this fella says, uh, Joe Sledge, where did the anti-social punk gimmick come from? And is it true Jerry the King Lawler? gave you the idea to change your look 
Uh, yes, he did. That that is true. Uh, well, we had uh, we called ourselves the Nasty Boys. We had these uh, at Minneapolis. We bought. We couldn't find no leather jackets. We didn't have money at the time, so we had. It was a a, a big a big ladies' place, and we bought fat women's raincoats that looked like leather, but they. Uh, Kurt Henning called them ple pleather because they weren't really leather. They were some kind of material. Uh, and uh, then we had a regular wrestling gear on. Like we had shiny uh, uh, tights and pants. And so the king called us in and said, hey, you guys call yourself the nasty boys, but you don't, there's nothing nasty. You don't look like being nasty or nothing. You guys are dressed like regular wrestlers. And then all of a sudden, me and Sag said, oh, you know, you're right. So me and Sag thought about it. And right away, the first thing we thought was cover up our bodies because we didn't have bodies like, you know, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior and, uh, you know, the British Bulldog. So why not wear a sweatshirt and cut the sleeves off? And then all we have to worry about is our arms looking good. And it covers up our body. So we were the first ones that really start to, started the cover up. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. Boss Man did it then. Nails did it. I mean, a lot of people started covering up with their own little gimmicks. So, uh, but, and uh, we came up with the splash gimmick, the graffiti. And uh, the only thing we really didn't like is uh, Jerry wanted to paint our faces. So that was too much like the Road Warriors. We weren't trying to be like the Road Warriors. But when Jerry did it, he's an artist. He's fantastic. So it looked great on us. But then when we were on the road and me and Sag had to do it, it looked like two two-year-old or three-year-old kindergarten kids face painting with their <laughs> fingers because it, it, it was just terrible. But then finally, we, you know, when we went back up to the AWA, we got rid of the, we got rid of that paint. But yeah, he was one of the ones to say, you know, hey, uh, you know, there was there was, a, there was a lot of different people uh, until we finally got to the WCW that helped us out along the way. Jimmy Schnooker was another one. Adrian Adonis, Cowboy Bob Orton, they all kind of uh, added in to do, you know, you're, you're doing something nasty, but you're not, you know, what what, what are you doing nasty? That was Adrian Adonis. You're not gouging somebody's eye, eye out. What about sticking their face in your armpit? Ha, ah, you know, that, you know, and that, that, that dawned on us. And then Piper was there to help when we, you know, we were with Roddy. And all these guys together molded us in from Kurt to, you know, Schnooker to, you know, Adrian Adonis, the Cowboy Bob Orton, I mean, to Jimmy Schnooker, I mean, to uh, uh, Roddy Piper, Hulk Hogan, all these guys, the list goes on. Everybody helped us in our way. And then when we finally hit WCW, we hit the ground running. We were ready. We had five years of, of, of all these little territories. We went to Florida Championship Wrestling after, you know, first of all, we went back up to AWA. And then we got fired again. I, I don't know what we did that time. I have no idea, but Vern got rid of us again. And then we went down to Florida Championship Wrestling because we met Steve Kern, uh, who's a good friend. And he used to come up, the, you know, a lot of times to Nashville when we were there because he was part of the, you know, the fabulous ones. So he got to be friends because Kurt told us about him. And he's a big river and a jokester too. So we came down and just showed up at Florida Championship Wrestling and said, Steve, you, you told us we can get a job anytime. We're here to work. So then we started down with Florida Championship Wrestling in 88 and Dusty Rhodes, Mike Graham, and uh, Steve Kerr were running it. So mm -hmm. then we had Dusty as a mentor. I mean, how can you get, go wrong there? And, uh, you know, that was, that was, a, that was a uh, awesome time. And then, and then SAG ended up, uh, Dusty was his brother, uh, brother-in-law. I mean, uh, SAG's his wife and Dusty's wife are sisters. So, and then just like, uh, my wife and Greg, the hammer's wife are sisters. So Greg, the hammer's my, uh, uh, brother-in-law so we got you know it's all in the family kind of thing here <laughs> do you know um, whenever, whenever anyone mentions greg everyone always does an impression it always goes on like whoa, whoa, whoa. something like <laughs> that's greg <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's he's very slow on the on the on the, on the delivery <laughs> <laughs> do you know i interviewed him a few months ago the interview's still not out yet as, as we record yeah. this but man, he—that's the most alert because he just had a big old, he just had a big old suck on some of the strongest weed in the world, and for whatever reason, he just went bing, and he was just absolutely, for whatever he was, uh, he was almost wired he, for Greg. Well, he he's been through everything, you know. And then I went over when I was, uh, you know, trying to date my wife, and uh, she was over at the house, and uh, so was, uh, you know, Julie and Greg. But uh, Greg's dad was over there, Johnny Valentine, and his his wife. And we ate this beautiful meal, 
And I swear he denies it, but he put something on my food because I left like 20 minutes after and I'm riding home. And all of a sudden my stomach went like three different ways. Like what the hell? Oh my, I got to go to the bathroom. And now I just pulled over on a side street and right in the middle of the street, I opened up my door, I ripped my pants down and I went right there in the middle of the street. And I went, oh, well, we had a big old Cadillac and the interior of it was white. So I said, well, at least I didn't crap in the car. And when I looked that back to get in the car, yes, it blew out before I got a chance to get to the street. And the whole front of the car was full of crap. So <laughs> I got home and Sag was in the living room where we were staying. And he saw me walk and he saw me, I had no drawers on, no pants on or nothing. And he goes, are you naked? I said, yeah, Greg's dad put something in my food and I shit the Cadillac up and I got to go clean it up. Jesus <laughs> Christmas. And then this dead, I mean, he's not here no more, but he, he always denied it. But I know he was, uh, Greg's dad was one of the big rivers of rivers, you know, and uh, I know he had to put something in my food. You just, that mm. just don't happen to you. So yeah, we got plenty of times we got ribbed, our eyebrows shaved off and all that stuff. So, you know, we got tortured too. So <laughs> man, it sounds like a shitty version of like, you know, that scene in pulp, <laughs> yeah, really. in, like pulp fiction. Literally. <laughs> hey, literally. Yeah, really. <laughs> hey, do you know what? Right, I, I I haven't even written this down, but I'm very interested in how many yeah. times have you been wrestling someone and someone just shit themselves? You know what? N never, really, never. never. No, but I heard it happen to Paul Orndorff once, and he wore them <laughs> white trunks, and then they could see it. But no, ne never, never, never me. Uh, <laughs> I, not not that I know of. Not too many people. You know, maybe Tugboat did. I'm not sure. Well, you're, but, just, uh, you're just guessing now, or is it just well, anyone but, with well, white but, trousers? But, 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 but by the looks of when uh, Tugboat used to take off his underwear on in the in the locker room, and then he would hang him up over there, and you saw saw him. Sometimes <laughs> you think he might have, you know. <laughs> and he's a good friend of mine too, so you know. <laughs> hey, do you know what? It takes a brave man to wear white bell bottoms out you just white anything white uh, trunks white uh, yeah. trousers white anything out there in a the wrestling yeah. room you're taking your hand you uh, know yeah. your life in your hands there hey just before we yeah. get off um because we're going to go to a bit of japan right. stuff in a minute but i okay. know you've got a million stories about Shawn michaels and marty Jannetty. but yeah when was the first time you actually wrestled them was it awa or was it in memphis because i know you feel with them in memphis awa awa yep and that's where we you know they really taught us and uh, they were a year ahead of us and starting and everything and we just clicked and we became the best of friends and they even lived with us i mean sean lived with us for a while and then uh, when we were in tennessee they came and lived with us and we only had a one-bedroom apartment but they came sean slept on the on the couch and marty slept in the <laughs> in the on the floor then one more one night it was like one or two in the morning and i smelled smoke and i went out and we had a fake fireplace but it, it lit up the you know the the gas thing you know, so you had fire. Well, Marty was throwing his bills that he owed in there. And I said, Marty, that's not a real fireplace, you idiot. You'll burn the whole damn complex down. We had a uh, fire, uh, uh, yeah, get a fire extinguisher and put it out. I mean, living with Marty was <laughs> was crazy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Do you know, I've never, I've never had the pleasure of talking to Marty, but everyone who brings up Marty always says, he's never changed. He's still the same way. He's still party Marty, man. <laughs> I I don't think he's partying as much, but uh, yeah, he still he still has that energy. I just talked to him actually last week, and he was he, he was bringing up some old stories. I said, "You're too much, Marty. You'll never change," you know. <laughs> so yeah, but we uh, we always had we always had some good times with them. Do you know? I know normally people would ask you something like, "Oh, give us some party stories," you know, with Martin and Sean and everything. But do you know what? Because you wrestled them really early on, I like to get into some of the specifics of what they taught well, you they as were far like, as the uh, ring. Well, they yeah, had the Rock and Roll Express, but they were, went as the Midnight Rockers, but they were coming up with, uh, like, trying to outdo, like, what uh, Ricky and, and Robert were doing and make it, you know, m m invent these new spots. And we were young, and we were going for it, and they were good spots, and a lot of the new spots that they were doing w w with us, we just clicked, and when we wrestled together, Man, we were we were on, you know what I mean? So when we we wrestled them there and then we wrestled them and we were already ready to go when we wrestled them in Tennessee. We had great matches with them there, but that's because we started in 86 wrestling them, you know, for the AWA. 
And, uh, and then then we went, ran back into him when we were in uh, WWE together and WWF at the time. And we wrestled him there, too, and had great matches. We had one of the greatest matches with them guys at Royal Law Albert Hall. And it's still it's still out there. They, they have that on a, uh, one of the videotapes back in the day and everything. But that was one of our, our, our best matches with him because we knew what both of us knew each other's moves. Like we knew what we were doing. It didn't matter. It was like bread and butter. Mm. You know what I mean? It's almost like we, we had that kind of same kind of chemistry uh, with uh, the, the Steiner brothers. We had the same kind of chemistry. Nobody wanted to wrestle the Steiner brothers when we got to WCW. And they said, hey, they're hurting people. They're doing this, they're doing that. Would you want mind wrestling the guys? And we said, hell no, we'll wrestle them. And they were. They were throwing us all over the place, man. Every flip. But we get up and punch them right in the face. We're barroom fighters. So we weren't going to take that crap. But they liked us, and we liked them, and, and, and we just got along. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just like the LOD. Uh, uh, another uh, great pair pairing from over in uh, Europe and England. The British Bulldogs in 88, we wrestled them in Japan, and that was a tag team tournament, and they took us in, and uh, uh, Dynamite, uh, under, he used to call me Nobby, and he took me and Sag under his wing, and him and Davey Boy helped us, you know, to show us how to wrestle, what kind of style to wrestle, because over in Japan, it's way different than it is over here, and man, uh, uh, Davey Boy had me in that suplex, and I swear I was losing consciousness, I was up there for about a minute. <laughs> And I weighed 300 some pounds at the time, and he had me up there. I was like, I couldn't even breathe. I said, "Davy, drop me already! I can't even breathe," you know. So, but we had a good we had a good time. But the funny thing is, we we got there first, and we met them guys, and then there was a you know they were buying shoe highs, and uh, that's like a vodka drink over there, and beers, and uh, and Davy Boy took us to go to a club, and we said okay, and we didn't think about it, we didn't pay for the bill, so. Uh, Dynamite had to end up paying for the bill, so he thought it was these young kids trying to get over on him. So then we had, had a talk with him the next th night. Hey, Dynamite, what do we owe you? We are so sorry. We didn't know it because that's the worst person you want on your against you is Dynamite Kid because that was he was he was an ultimate river. Mm. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> did, hey, did he get you? Uh, you, he got me a couple times with different stuff, but he used to get Abby all the time. I'd do a little butcher. He'd call him all times at night. We'd go heavy champ and then hang up the phone. So <laughs> yeah, it, just, hey, it was crazy. It was crazy times back then. You know? I, uh, do you know, because you mentioned uh, Japan eating out Ribera. Did you ever go to the steakhouse? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Have you still got the jacket? Uh, yes, I still got a jacket. I got, I got one or two. I, I, Every time you went there, you got a jacket. So, you know, but I got I got a bunch of them stored away. And I know Sag was just in his uh, uh, attic and he had all this old stuff that he didn't know he had. And he was showing me. I said, I can't believe you still got this and still got that. It was all the old stuff back in from the 80s and everything, you know. So that was pretty cool to see all that stuff again. Uh, so look out on eBay soon for a, like a big. Yeah, yeah. No, he's not. He doesn't get rid of anything. He's, he's keeping it, you Ooh. know. Good. I'm, yeah. glad, I'm glad you said that. Uh, do you know, uh, we actually had a couple of questions about Dynamite Kid. Uh, this person said, I can't find the guy's name, but where was Dynamite physically around? Uh, are we talking 1988 then? So he's left. This was left 88. WWF, yeah. he, was still, he, he, was still, he was still rocking and rolling. Mm. And then in 19, I don't know if it was 92 or 93, we went to Manchester. And me, okay. 93, and when yeah. we went to Manchester, me... Brett and Chief J went out to see him where he was staying, and that was a pretty bad part of town there. And we surprised him, and he was so surprised. And that's the picture you see. They just put it up. It was thirty years old, and uh, I think Harry sent me a picture of it. When you know, uh, I think uh, Dynamite has Brett like that. I'm in the middle, and it's us three. We took a picture with him, and they just put that up again because it was thirty years old. But uh, he came out that night. That's the last time he came out, and he didn't go to the matches, but he came afterwards to the bar, and he had the greatest time with all the guys. And we toasted, we had we had fun. And that was the last time I really seen him. And but he would stay in touch to Harry and that to me. But uh, yeah, he was to me. He was always a, a a great great person, and he was always very first class and and. He was just a great guy to us. He, I mean, we have no complaints about Dynamite or Davy Boy at all because they were always nice to us. And Davy Boy lived in 
Florida, Tampa at the time. And when he was down there, he used to come to our Christmas parties and all the time. I got uh, on one of my videotapes, I got Davy Boy singing Jingle Bells, and I should put that out there. Yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't the greatest version, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, I can very much. Yeah, uh, it doesn't strike me this kind of person who can carry a tune. <laughs> well, I was at Hogan's karaoke bar, and I went with Hacksaw and his wife, Deborah. And uh, Jim went up and sang, uh, 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 Matt, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, God, uh, she sings Bobby McGee and all that. But he sang, uh, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? But he sang it like in a Hank Williams Jr. It was just terrible. I was laughing so hard I couldn't even because it was terrible. And then <laughs> about five singers later, a guy came up like a heavy metal guy singing. Yeah, da, 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 da. And Jim looked over at me. He goes, I was better than that fucking guy. And I looked at Jim and I started laughing. I went, no, you weren't, Jim. <laughs> I think you don't want to go to karaoke and see a bunch of people who can sing. I mean, you want to see the yeah. absolute shit uh, so you can laugh. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I can sing a little bit of Joe Cocker and that, so I always stick to the songs I know I'm not going to be that bad at. Yeah. You know? So, what's the and, Joe um, Cocker? What's the Joe Cocker? Uh, I, I do uh, uh, with a little help from your friends. You know, da, what da, da, da. would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? You don't do that you one know, with Jennifer so, Warnes, then, do you? Uh, no. Oh, well, was uh, it, oh, where we that? belong. Uh, oh, no, I don't. I don't do that one. No, that's that's a little too high. I I, I can do you all so beautiful, really good. And I stick to the lower lower version, especially as my throat from doing all these interviews and all that stuff. Man, it's a luck I remember all that stuff from getting smashed over the head with a steel chair three million times. <laughs> hey, well, they give you the words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but sometimes I can't read the words. No. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Guitar Freak right. has asked William William Regal. Here's the story from before. Told a story on his podcast about how the Nasty Boys were in Japan. I'm assuming New Japan, since I don't think Regal ever wrestled for a uh, All Japan. But he said that they played a rib on Paul Diamond. Do I need to say any more about this, or shall I refresh your memory more? <laughs> no. I, we uh, uh, yeah, there was some things going on, and Paul Diamond had the Max Moon costume and and uh we we did some things a lot of things went on but the, the main thing was before he left before we left uh he had that big you know that carried all the stuff and sag went down to the local fish market and bought a bunch of fish and threw it in there and cl they closed it up and they shipped it they shipped it to the united states now imagine to go to customs and finally to his house and he opened up that box with all them fish in there, and they were probably all dead and rotten. I could have just imagined it must have stank up the whole house. First of all, I mean, I mean, it, it, it was it was brutal. I mean, was that one of the stories of, of uh, was, Regal was talking about? That was exactly the story Regal was talking about. Yeah. Fish in a suitcase. <laughs> That's it. We put it in his his Max Moon costume. You know, <laughs> <laughs> do you know that gimmick like stunk? Yeah. Like before the fish went in there as well, so the yeah, fish just probably yeah, down no, a bit. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah, exactly. But to take it all the way home and then him not knowing it, oh man, I couldn't have just imagine opening up the you know the, the that you know the big body. It was a big like a, a a rolling unit, you know. Oh, that must have stank so bad. You know, he never did say nothing. I know we got blamed. You know, even if we didn't do the rib, we got blamed. That's that. That's what happened at the end of the thing. Everybody was pulling ribs, and we were getting blamed for everything, and we didn't even do half of them. Oh. Owen Hart did a lot of ribs, and we got blamed for him because no one thought Owen would be doing ribs, and Owen was a big river. Well, I, I was know? just, I was just going to ask you now. Can you remember a specific rib where you were blamed and you categorically, hand on heart, didn't do it? Um. Yes, I did tell you, rib. Uh, Eddie brought Eddie Guerrero's eyebrows shaved. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got blamed, and I didn't do it. You know, we we helped Eddie. You know, so he would pass out. But uh, besides that, no, two guys do it. You would never know when your when your wildest dreams did it. Is uh, and are the names being withheld. Um, you know what? It's long enough now. I mean, I even got yelled at by 
Eddie's mom, when I went over to the house a long time ago, when, you know, everything was still, you know, we were all WCW, she said, you shaved my son's, my baby's eyebrows off. And I said, it wasn't me, I promise. But no, I'm going to stooge it out. One was Chris Benoit, and the other one was Barbarian. <laughs> and you would never think it in the in the world. Oh, they'll do, well, you know, Chris is Chris. That that situation, I don't even want to talk about. No, but, no. but 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 Barbarian, you know, he's one of the nicest guys ever. But he was so overjoyed because he never did nothing like that before. But we had nothing to do with it. But we got blamed, you know, because eyebrows shaved right away. You're looking at the nasty boys. Was, hey, we didn't, and we didn't even bring the razors out. They did. So, <laughs> but yeah, we got blamed for shaving Eddie Guerrero's eyebrows off, and we didn't even do it. Well, I did. So for some reason I did sag then I got blamed. Well there you go. We've we've set we've righted a wrong there. 30, 30 yeah. years or so after the uh after the, the initial eyebrow shaving. Yes, exactly. Uh because you mentioned WCW, we're gonna do a couple of WCW questions and then we're hey, gonna get on to our first I, I, game. I, hey, I'll tell you I'll tell you one that you're not, I'm not supposed to admit it, but Go for it. I did I did shave Ric Flair's eyebrows off. No. Oh, oh yeah, and then when he hit when he hit England and he looked in the mirror and he saw he had no eyebrows. Oh man, he was calling the office, telling him, get them two fat bastards back. I don't want to be resting with him. <laughs> yeah, but I, I shaved mine off too. But the only thing was the door opened and I didn't know it. And Terry Taylor had to be sitting right there and he saw me shave him off. So I tried to blame it on Kurt because Kurt always did that. So I was showing it was Kurt and Terry Taylor said, Rick, it was knobs i saw him shave his own eyebrows off because i shaved my own off because i'm ugly anyway who cares i was saying kurt got me too damn it and then <laughs> then rick finally found out it was me so he he always brings it up so. <laughs> who, who, who got involved with just shaving one eyebrow off because that's almost worse that, that, that that's that's what kurt did he would shave one eyebrow off so you look look, look like a goofball <laughs> you know, you come up to yeah, we come up to check in, and the person's looking at you like you have one eyebrow, and you have, don't have another eyebrow. It's like, <laughs> like what, what's what's wrong with this guy? You know, so that was Kurt's doing, hey, and I I don't know if he learned that from Fuji or not. Fuji got trained by, I mean, uh, Kurt got trained by Fuji with the ribbing stuff, and 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 Fuji was pretty serious with the ribbing stuff too. You know, I uh, I used to do a podcast with Don Morocco. And he told me, oh, yeah, we oh, we did an entire we did an entire oh episode just on Fuji ribs, and like fifty would, minutes hey, of it was just pets being fed to people. I, I would I would I would have loved to hear that because Don was with Fuji a lot, and and Fuji was the man, man. He was he was he was great. He was a good good guy, and uh, you know, and, and taught you a lot and knew a lot about the business. So, you know, like I said, we got trained by by really some of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and, and it's an honor. To have learned that you know and, and that's what kind of style we came up with and it was kind of different style it wasn't because the road warriors had their style but we weren't like the roars we're, we weren't like that strong you know the uh, uh whatchamacallit strong stuff uh you know the power slams and all that stuff and you know we got into just being like rowdy and like we're like we're uh barroom fighting or something you know what i mean so mm -hmm. Oh, it worked out good. What the hell? You know, you only live once and go around and now my body's all beat up, but uh my body's uh this bad because you know, when SAG got hurt, when I came back to WCW in ninety-nine, I went in the hardcore division and I was the world champ for four years. So doing that for two and a half years, or, or about two years, uh for two hundred and seventy-five days a year. It took a toll because they weren't buying us nothing. We were using the old stuff from the building. So me and Fit Finley were whacking each other with them cast iron trash can lid. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, trash cans that were like like cement. We were going through real tables. Then Finley almost got his leg cut off when I threw him through one table. It was made with Formica. He was laying there with with his leg. Oh, it was the worst thing. I took my shirt off and put it over quick. I. You know, right away, call people back. I couldn't care about the kayfabe or anything because I was worried about him, you know. And uh, he got drop foot from that, but now he was back. He got back in the ring and everything. But there's only one Finley. He's a tough SOB, too, just like there's only one Lord, you know. Yeah. So, you know, because you mentioned Finley, uh, I was going to go on something else, but because this is like Finley was quite far back, but I do want to get to that. Can you right? So I know you and Fit Finley feuded for a short while uh, before I get almost to the feud, a, almost a year. Oh well, okay, a long while then. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, who got the haircut first? Who got the buzz cut and then like the blonde spikes? Because you had the same haircut for a while. 
Well, uh, I always had this. So th this was mine from when I when I came into business. We came in with that, and people were thinking we were the road warriors. And I said, no, you know, we're we're the nasty boys. And you know, we, we had you know I had the mullet, and Sag had the mohawk too. So we came in with that, and then that's when um, Russo wanted to change everybody back to their real names. No nasty, no this. No, that, and then we kind of went into the military thing, and then me and Fit got together where he trained me, remember? Mm -hmm. He trained me at first, and then and, and we split up down the ways, but I, he, was, he was like my coach, and then he put me through all this stuff, and that was all real. I was in a, a, a he was making me do sit-ups in a, like a crick river, and it was freezing out, and I'm in a, Get this shot already. It's freezing out here doing this stuff. So, but yeah, I, I always had a good time with Fit. He's like, I love him like a brother, and and, and Lord's the same way. I, he's a, he's a great guy and and uh, a, a good friend. You know, these guys are good friends of ours, and they always will be. You know, yeah. so Regal uh, very much has got like the utmost respect for Fit Finley purely as a wrestler and just somebody who was understatedly just one of the toughest guys out there and he, you know he didn't have to let it be known for it to just be true and everyone just had utmost respect for him did you well learn fit respect for him deal. as well in that well, sense well fit, well fit was in the real deal he was in the you know the army in, you know over in ireland and stuff and you know they're, they're they weren't schooling around when he was over there so he's he's a tough he's one tough sob i put him right up there with everybody else yes he's a he's a tough sob and a great guy though great guy great family guy and and I just was asking Sag yesterday, um, who is um, he wrestled Germany a lot, but I think he's from England. Uh, but the older wrestler now, um, but he wrestled Germany a lot. Uh, he knows Lord real good. He knows fit. It's not Dave Taylor. Gonna, you'll, you'll you'll have that. No, no, no. You'll have to ask Sag. He's older. I mean, like maybe seventies now. You'll know him if Sag 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 will mention him. I keep I forget his name, but he we met him in Japan and he loved us, you know. And then he told Lord and because Lord and Fit both admire him. He's a he's been around a long time, mm -hmm. you know. So, but ask Sag. Sag will remember his name. Uh, just one one more thing before we get off Fit is yeah. you mentioned briefly the broken leg. Someone else asked about that as well. What was the circumstances about how he ended up uh, Fit ended up broken leg? Everyone? What was it? Was he it? He didn't break his leg. What he did was I had a table lined up the night before, sold out Tupelo. When I threw it through, it was plywood. He couldn't break it. So he was so pissed off. The night next night, he goes, I'm, I'm getting through that table knob. So when I threw him this time, when he hit, it looked like a bowling ball went through it. It's just, just a round thing. Here, the table, with the, the, the face of it was made with Formica. So it cut him up. So we cut him like an axe, like somebody took an axe and hit him like this, right on right where your, your knee and that is. So it was down at a bone, but it cut his nerves and everything. His his leg was hanging open. So he didn't break his leg. He cut off. Oh, it was dude. I don't even like thinking about it. It was so and there he is cut open like that. And then I got cut from it, just a little cut right here. And he was going, we we're both in the emergency room together, and he goes. No, just do what you got to do. No pain medicine for me. And I was like, well, give me, give him my, give me his <laughs> medicine to me. And I only had a little cut here, you know, but I was really worried uh, about him. And then the next day I went face to face and Jimmy Hart saved me, but I was going to punch Eric great right in the face because they were making 90 million a year and they wouldn't buy us, you know, a hundred dollar uh, uh, stuff from the Home Depot where we're not going to hurt each other. You know, you know, it's it's still going to hurt, but you get the right kind of trash cans and right kind of tables and all that stuff and stop letting us just get old stuff from the back of these old buildings that are is real, you know, stuff that can hurt you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then uh, Eric said, you, you can't don't blame this on us and blah, 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 blah. And then right when I was going to snatch him, Jimmy Hart goes, come on, baby, we got to do something down Sun Studios. And, and he grabbed me out of it because we did have to do some kind of filming down there. But if not, man, I was I was going to choke Eric out. I swear I was so pissed off because mm. Fit was my friend. And then, now he's laying and he had he had dead foot for a while. I dropped foot, but he's because it cut, cut a couple of nerves, but he came back, man. He wore that boot for a while, but he came back and he was wrestling again. I went, man, you're, you're, you're the toughest SOB I know because I saw the injury. It was bad, you know? 
Are you uh, ready for our first game now? So I call it name Let's association, go. and it bring is, it on. I'm going to give you a sentence. You got the nasty boy in a good mood. No, oh, good man, good man. Uh, I'm going to give you a description, a sentence. I want you to tell me okay. the first name that comes into your mind. It could be from any locker room anywhere, and the first one is funniest person in the locker room. Um, Kurt Henning was pretty funny in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Is it, yeah. I've, right, because I've got so many of these, I'm going to actually ask a load of them, and then I'm going to ask right. them to uh, your man as well. So we're going to compare right. who says what with these ones. Right. Last man standing at the bar, drinking-wise. Well, besides me, no. <laughs> Flair, was, Flair was there pretty late. You know, uh, he he would be a late, late person there. But I know he that. doing the whole over-the-shoulder thing for a lot of it? Uh sometimes he was you know we caught him doing that sometimes but he was there at the end uh you know it was never just one person but it was always like a group of us would be the last ones there and, and uh i don't know you know godfather would be there sometimes uh, you know a, a taker uh you know any of the samoans you get any, any you know from haku to schnooker to <laughs> you get any of them guys mm. they're gonna be at the bar to the end uh you know uh, to, to, that list goes on. There's not just one. There's not, there's not just one person that was the last one at the bar. Uh, it was usually a bunch of us that had to be asked and told the to lead because the bar was closing down. But sometimes, you know, if Rick was there and threw some money, that they left it open and everything. They left the bar open and everything. So yeah, it was uh, a plenty. Of, it was way different back in our day. Like uh, Triple H said to me when I was at uh, Rick's uh, 70th birthday. He says it's changed now, Noms. I said, well, is it really true that the guys today, like they, they'll go up, they'll play Nintendo and eat their you know, room servers and drink milk? And he goes, yeah. He goes, it's, he goes, when you guys were, were wrestling, these were like rock stars who were playing the rock and roll life. And, you know, it, it was, it was kind of like that. You know what I mean? I said, well, yeah, it was like that. That's the, that's the only reason I got in it. It was like, yeah, this is, this is my job. I wrestle beat people up and then afterwards we go have a party at the ass. Oh yeah. I'm in for that all over the world. Are you kidding me? You know? So, uh, that's, that's, that was my response. And I was laughing at him, you know, but I said, I know everything changes and that, and the guys today are doing fantastic. I still watch. And I, I I like to watch everybody, but I, I I really keep an eye on the the you know the the people that I know that were kids. They were really little babies, and you know from Charlotte Flair to I mean uh, the the Usos. I mean just it goes on and on and on. Just uh, like Joe Henning, uh, you know all these guys I knew that were really really uh, you know just babies at the time, you know. So and uh, it was very uh, tragic, and it was a heartfelt uh for me uh to go to uh a uh, uh, brace or, or windham's uh uh you know celebration for life because you know brought up a lot of bad b memories for me from because I, me and sag lost a lot of people back in the day young and then for that to happen to him and i knew him since he was a little baby and 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 uh mike rotundum irs was he's a one of our best friends and my thoughts and prayers still go out to him and stephanie and the family going through all that stuff but but he was he was there when i got stabbed so you know and help you know these guys we got the fans so mad they stabbed us so that's that's heat there but he was right with us there fighting these guys off and then they took me to the hospital after that uh because i was bleeding but uh anyway you know so i was you know i had a couple talks with mike and everything like that but th that was a hard one because that you know it just brought up a lot of bad you know just not bad but just uh, so many people that we lost in our era that were young you know and i the list goes on i guess just you know you know from rick Drew to davy boy to eddie guerrero to uh kurt hanning to hawk i mean just, and it's way too young mm. way too young no, you know? I know, I know that was a terrible week as well because I think Terry yeah. Funk passed away like a day before. Oh yeah, before and then Terry well. did too. Yeah, Terry did too. And, too, and he was a he. We we uh we had good good matches with him too. You know, we knew him because of Dusty, and we knew Dick Murdoch because of Dusty. They all would come down to Florida Championship Wrestling at the time, and Dusty would introduce us to all of his old old cowboy buddies, and they were all crazy. They always <laughs> say we're crazy. These old guys were way crazier than us. You know, when he had when I had Ray Stevens and Wahoo firing us, 
I, I was going, really? Wahoo and uh, Ray, the two of the craziest wrestlers when they were back in the day drinking and causing barroom fights. Hey, that's going to be a bar of, that's, that's a badge of honor for you then, isn't it? Sure, you've out crazy yeah, yeah, them well, too, yeah, 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 they're telling us we're crazy. And we said, <laughs> you're way crazier than us. I mean, you guys, you know, come on, give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, smelliest wrestler. Oh, jeez. Uh, let's see. Who would be the smelliest wrestler? Who did stink? I don't know. Uh, maybe some of the big guys. I don't know. Every once in a while, I think uh, maybe maybe Fred, you know, good old tugboat. Uh, maybe he didn't use too much deodorant. Uh, you oh, know. Poor Fred. But so so, some, so some he's possibly guys. shit himself, heard, and he's the smelliest. I heard, I, I, heard, I heard stories, though, uh, Andre, sometimes he didn't clean his thing, and his strap was thinking, and he put that around your, your mouth and that, yeah. and, you know. But yeah, I never, <laughs> I never got a chance to wrestle laundry. But he did, uh, you know, he did make me an honorary member of the, uh, you know, when we were over there in a Europe tour. He gave, he he said the name of this tour is "Don't Be a Knob." I, he <laughs> sat and asked me to drink with him that night and everything. And then we met his whole family over in France. And it was really an honor. You know, and that's the first time I really got to know Andre really good. You know, and that was at the end of his career. But what a great man he was, you know. So, hey, and the reason the reason he said don't be a knob is because we went to Barcelona. And it was our first trip. We just won the belts. And me and Undertaker had to go out with Piper. And I woke up and the, the bus left me. They left me because they had to go to another town to drive the bus because there was only one flight to go to that town and Vince didn't want to miss it. So I'm in Barcelona, not knowing how to speak any English. I mean, not Spanish, and I'm I, I'm freaking out. I just got my my passport, my credit cards, and I'm yelling, "This! Can anybody help me? Can anybody help me?" And finally, somebody helped me and got me on that flight. And I got there, and I uh, got on right when I got off the plane. I got a cab. It cost me 167 dollars to the building. I went running in the back, and guess what? They weren't even there yet. Because they had to go to a hake a bus and come to the town. So I got there before them. About 15 minutes later, they come walking in. And there I was with my feet on the table. And Sai goes, Knobs is here. And that night, that's when Andre called me over. Because the old school of old wrestling is, hey, no matter how much you want to party and do your thing, you got to be ready the next day, ready to go, sober, ready to wrestle. You're the world champion. And I, he saw me do that. And I gained Andre's respect by by uh, that whole incident happened. And that's when he came and told me to come over and sit by him and sit down. And then he said, we toast. And the name of this tour is Don't Be a Knob. And he <laughs> laughed. And I was laughing because if I didn't laugh, I didn't want to get swatted off the seat, you know, because he had the big old hands on him. So, <laughs> Hey, do you know with Andre, like, so obviously, you know, you turned up early. You did what you had to do to get to the building that day yeah. in time. Uh, how generally would... Andre sort of judge somebody how would he judge somebody if they liked him or didn't like them you know what I don't know but I know uh before I got there and I heard the story and I saw some of it that somehow they gave Bam Bam a really good fast push and he got mad he somehow uh Bam Bam pissed him off somehow and he really he really beat the hell out of Bam Bam out there in the ring I mean you know Bam Bam thought he was going to kill him. You know what I mean? So um, I wouldn't want to get him mad. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then even for uh, uh, WrestleMania three, this is, this is a shoot. I didn't Hulk told me this personally. They didn't know if Andre was going to let Hulkster win. No, he never told Hulk nothing. Uh, and, and Hulk said he got in there early and all <laughs> Andre said was sit down and they drank beer until the until the matches came up. And then when they went out, he still didn't know. But he was there for everything and the slam and everything. But uh, no, he didn't know until, until, until it actually happened, you know. And I don't think Vince knew either because Andre did what Andre wanted to do. <laughs> hey, I, I ask this I ask this quite a lot of people these days, but everyone always yeah. loves like shoot height stories. Yeah. So yeah. what was, I mean, obviously you knew Andre, you know, in the last few years of his life. Uh, How uh, tall do you think Andre was then? He kind of shortened up a little bit because he, you know, he was getting hunched over, you know. So I think he was still about, he had to be about seven. He still weighed a lot too, you know. But back back when 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 Hulk went against him, he was definitely about seven four, 
And I I I would think about six hundred, probably about six seven hundred pounds. He was he was you know he was bigger than the the big show when in, in his heyday. Mm. And back if you really look back in his heyday, he uh was in Japan and he was doing all kind of stuff, drop kicks and everything. You know, so I mean you got to give it to him. He, and then you think about it, back in that day, they didn't have nothing for big guys like that to fly over. So he was always putting small little you know spaces and you know it's like kind of like. It was sad, you know, because now they have, you know, bigger plate for big guys. You can, you know, sit. They could, you know, they used to be able to take out that middle seat so he could sit in first class. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, that's old school. And, you know, we got, that's the way we were brought up. So, and it really helped out with our wrestling too, you know, mm -hmm. watching all the matches. Definitely you have to watch all the matches. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, that, that helps you out. You see how everybody else does it. Uh, next question is stiffest or most reckless in the ring. Wow, the nasty boy stuff. <laughs> no, I, I, I won't let you say yourself. I won't let you say yourself. Uh, I don't know. That, you know, there were a lot of uh, guys that 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 laid it in when we wrestled. We we didn't care. Like the, the Steiners were pretty stiff. I mean, you know, but they, they never hurt us. Uh, even even Bret Hart. You know, when we, we they used to throw us in the corner when we had them six man and he kicked to kick us in the head. I would tell us, Brett, you're supposed to be the the Mr. Light guy. And I said, You're kicking our head off every night. What are you what are you talking about? You know, but uh there were certain guys on occasions that would play a couple in the road warriors, of course, were were solid, you know, but uh, you know, nothing that hurt us, you know, it it's wrestling. It means you know, you're supposed to be hit, so it's no big deal. You know what I mean? It's, you know, we were used to it, so it was it wasn't nothing to us. So uh, there were a lot of guys that hit hit us back, and 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 uh, you know, uh, nobody nobody ever really stepped over the line. I mean, when we when we got spudded, we got spudded, and that you know that's that's part of the game. It happens every now and again. You know, most memorable thing you ever saw on an airplane? Oh. Damn. That, well, that you can talk I don't about. Know. <laughs> no, but I don't. I, I'm. I don't know. We always had good times on, on a plane. We we never uh, we weren't there for that all that that other crazy stuff. But uh, you know, I did have a a, a thing going on when you no, know, I, I don't know if uh, the time Rick Flair's eyebrows got shaded up, but somehow it was like a young guy old guy feud, and somehow someone picked me to go like. Part, you know, go go against Piper. Like I'm gonna go against Piper uh, in, in in partying and stuff. Are you kidding me? So I was passed out. He put shaving cream and smacked my face, and went, I would wake up like a minute later, and there was no one around. I had shaving cream on my face. And he did all kind of stuff to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was. I didn't remember half of it, but I knew it was. I read <laughs> smack marks on my face from Piper. <laughs> you know, but we, we were learning. We were just the kids in the business. You know, we just got into WWE, so or WWF at the time. But hey. that's uh, yeah. Quite welcome. Um, next one is biggest single payoff for an event. Oh, I God, I don't, I don't know. I can't remember that. I mean, it was, it was probably a WrestleMania. Uh, WrestleMania uh, when we uh, won the belts from uh, the Heart Foundation. Mm -hmm. That was a, that was a, that was a good check. You know, real good check. Uh, it, all, it always depended where you were on the, on the card, you know, and. And we were champs for a while there. And, then, you know, so we were champs for uh, uh, WrestleMania. And then we were also champs for SummerSlam when we lost them to LOD. So that was another good payday. You know, and then we were supposed to get them back at WrestleMania 9. But that's when Brutus came back because he, after his face steal, and he was uh, kind of, uh, you know, whining to Hulk. I'm, you know, I need money, this and that. So Hulk brought him back as a tag team. And in one month, we got... You know, we worked the angle for six months to beat the IRS and and DiBiase, and I'm pretty sure Ted was glad he was wrestling in Hulkster because it's more money if you're wrestling Hulkster than you're wrestling the Nasty Boys. But mm -hmm. we were kind of pissed because we got knocked off the whole show. We weren't even on WrestleMania nine. So, you so know? what was the original uh, creative for that then? You you were going to beat them clean? Yeah, we were going to beat them. Well, we were going to. Uh, yeah, we were going to beat them clean because they were the heels at the time, and we were getting back at Jimmy because Jimmy. 
that's when we uh, tossed Jimmy on top of them. And, you know, they, they, Jimmy kind of screwed us and, you know, built a thing with them. So that was the angle. We did that for almost six, seven months. And then in one month, boom, we were all done. I had my family and everybody coming out there. And then I wasn't even on the show. <laughs> yeah. did, did they still give you WrestleMania payoff anyway? Because they were bumping you from that oh. thing. No. Hell no. And I was mad as hell. I got drunk and I was saying some things I maybe shouldn't have said, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, it was just, I, I was just, I was, I was just, that's the way the politics go when, you know, it is what it is. So, you know, water under the bridge now. Mm. I've, right. I've got a question. I'm, I'm going to deviate here a bit. I, I really want to know this because right. I've asked a couple right. of people. They've all got their own theories. Why did. Hulk Hogan turn up at WrestleMania nine with a big black eye. Why? Because he was in a wave runner accident about a week before that. And he almost lost his eye, but yeah, he was in a wave runner accident and he, he fell off. And I think whoever was next to him, he, he got hit with the wave runner in the face and he had, he had to go, he had to go in, uh, go in the hospital and everything, you know? And that kind of, that's why he was, uh, you know, they, they they worked on him there for a while, but everything came out good, which was good. But he could have got seriously injured there, you know. So, but yeah, that was a, it was a wave runner accident before that. Do you know, right, so I, I know you're going to tell me that this is false, but there's been an internet rumor for many, many, many years that Randy Savage calls the black eye. Is that just, no. com is that just complete nonsense? No. That's stupid. Yes. Yes, that is. That's complete nonsense. They were good friends, you know. They broke, split up there for a little bit, but at the end, they, they became friends again. So, you know, and he misses Randy a lot. I know that, you know, they were, they were, they, they were like uh, bread and butter when they were in uh, Florida together. So next one I've got now is uh, most high strung or edgy nervous kind of guy. Oh God. Who is high strung? I don't know. Um, my brain's so dead I can't remember, but I know there's some, there were some guys that, uh, out there always always nervous. Oh God, like uh, God, I nothing comes to mind right now. You know, nope. to get the next question. Nope. I, I don't know who edgy, like uh, nervous wise. I I just can't I can't remember. That's fine. I'll move on to the next one. Um, did you ever refuse to lose to somebody? No, never, never. Not not even when we uh uh we weren't gonna we didn't feel like losing to the Steiners. That first time when we the match that got us into the WWE was the Hollywood uh Halloween Havoc. And then Kevin Sullivan took me and Saget aside and he said, Hey man, you know, why not? Let him do the Frankensteiner, you'll get over it. We were getting our heat back anyway, and we both said, You know what? You're right, that's serious. You know. Uh, let's do it. So that was the only time we ever kind of questioned what they were doing. But besides that, no, no, no other time. You know, what, what, yes, one other time. Uh, when we were about to leave, uh, they were trying to let the Steiners beat us because we were going back, we were going to WWE. And we said, uh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a DQ and, and, uh, you know, that's it. And then, then he went to the Steiners to try to have the Steiners like beat us you know, legitimately. And Ricky and, and Scotty stuck up for us, said, we're not doing that to them. He goes, they're, they're our friends. We had great matches with them. They're going up to WWF. That's the way they want to go out. Fine. So that pissed off that Jim Hurd. And, and I don't know who else was in there at the time. I think Jim Ross was in the office and stuff like that. They didn't like that the Steiners took, took our side. But the Steiners took our side and said, nope, they weren't going to do it. So... Hey, uh, someone actually uh, wrote in beforehand, and I might as well ask it now. Uh, someone said that you took a particularly bad Frankenstein once, so you managed to land like right on your head. Do you remember when that was? Yeah, that 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 was the that was the one the match you beat me at. Yeah, yeah, yeah you watch it, but it's on Halloween Havoc. Yeah, you beat me at the Frankenstein, and it looks like I landed right on my right on my neck. But but Arno was calling me a jellyfish, so <laughs> thank God it wasn't the, the muscular one. I probably would have broke my neck, but no, I <laughs> didn't get hurt at all. Not. Not at all, you know. I mean, even when uh, the the worst one I took, I don't know if you ever saw it, was uh, when we wrestled uh, Cactus and Max Payne. Yeah, and Max Payne threw me the wrong way. He was supposed to do me a belly to belly. He gave me a, 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 a over the top, 
And I was thought he was going that way and he ripped out my shoulder, you know, it, my shoulder landed, my back of my feet hit my head. I, you know, bent so much. And Rick and them guys thought I was really screwed up, but I did tear my shoulder out, you know, and then you see Sag, his reaction, he came in with the guitar and that was a truthfully a real shot there with the guitar. That was no, uh, well, you know, no, no light stuff going on there that was the real deal <laughs> uh, next one is best jobber uh best jobber well barry horowitz was pretty good he, he could say he put himself as a good character and got a character out of it so he was good you know iron mike sharp if you want to go way back mm -hmm. then you know he was always good you know so you know yeah you, you had a couple of guys that really got into they knew their role and they did their, they, their job really good but yeah them two them two were really they they were always good right this next one i've never asked anyone before who were the wrestlers who carried a gun with them uh bill dundee was one of them <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> just we just talked I, to jamie in fact as well about uh bill yeah, Henry, uh, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, uh, Bill said he was in the shooters one time and we, we smacked Jamie up a little bit because he was, he was real young at the time and he was real cocky. So we, <laughs> so I held him and so I gave him a couple of real nice little slaps, just <laughs> teach the kid, you know. <laughs> you know, and nothing's Bill changed. Was, nothing's and then changed. Bill came, Bill came and said he was going to shoot us and I go, <laughs> bring that gun in here and I'll stick it up your ass and <laughs> pull the trigger. So, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, next one is, and everyone's always got an answer for this one: uh, the best and yeah. worst road agents. Well, they were some of them had good tensions in mind. Like George Steele is who we bugged to get in the business, that, but then when we became an agent, he turned into an ass. Like you know, you know, finding us if we're two five minutes late and stuff like that. You got to be an hour there, be an hour before. But uh, but George turned into like a little like that, you know what I mean? And Chief could be kind of strong at the time. Chief J, he was he was strict, but he liked this, so he gave us a little leniency too. So so that was good. And Guerrilla was always good. Renee Rene Goulet, Blackjack Lanza, he was always nice. This he's the one that left me in in, uh, in Barcelona. He said, "Leave the fat bastard." <laughs> he wouldn't even let Saga go up and get me out of my room. I guess he wanted me to fail. I don't know because you know all the big thing was we came right in there in November, and then they put me in the Royal Rumble. And I look on the car. I'm, oh, I'm coming in the 17th. That's great. And then I look, and I, I keep looking. I keep looking. I keep looking. And me, Earthquake, and Hogan at the end. I get what the hell? Are you kidding me? And then Hulk goes, "How do you want to go out, kid?" I said, "Give me the big foot. I'll go out backwards." He says, "You're pretty big. You think you can make that?" I said, "No problem." When they kicked me, and I saw the power of Hulkamania and all the people going in the building, I missed the top rope by about that much backwards. I don't even know how I fell, but uh, I didn't care. I was so so uh, elated. And then right there, they turned us right uh, uh, that we were in the rest of the Heart Foundation for the belts, like we learned about maybe a, about a couple of weeks before maybe four weeks before or three weeks before that we were going to beat them so all them guys that were there like the road warriors power and glory and guys were there for a year or so and then we just come in and we're still young and they put give us the belts right away talk about heat oh, really? and we had to come yeah and then we had to come in when they're working out at the gym with the belts on eating ice cream cones so that didn't that didn't really uh you know, st stir anything up. You, know, you think the Road Warriors got about, look at them two fat bastards that just won the belts are coming in here while we're working out, eating ice cream, came in with the belts on eating ice cream cones. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> did, how much did that mean to you, you know, the whole tag team belt thing? Is it, is it, is it, oh, it, dude, it's big. I mean, I mean, right now, I mean, I would love to, hopefully uh, this coming year, 2024, that we get put in the Hall of Fame because it's, it's in Philly and we're from Allentown. And, uh, you know, we, we we put our time in. I think we deserve a chance to get up there. But, you know, I know it's a lot of politics and that, but we were we were through all the divisions. You know, we were in WCW. We were, we were in almost every territory there was. And uh, we always carried ourselves professional. We got a little bit of a, a rep with, with the ribbing and the joking, but nothing was ever serious. We never did nothing really wrong that, you know, the cops were involved and all that stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... 
uh, you know, and, and we do do everything. We do a lot of stuff for charities and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm ho hopefully they, they, uh, they see us. We, we got put in, two, we actually got put in two hall of fames this year. We were excited. We got put in the international one in New York, uh, in August. And then right after that, we went to the cauliflower alley one in Vegas and they, they gave us a, a hall of fame award, you know? So we got two hall of fame awards, uh, this year, which was, we felt really honored and privileged to, you know, uh, you know, to accept. So hopefully that maybe you'll lead into, you know, getting into WWE one. So where, what, we're trying. What city uh, would, I don't know wh where the, I know that there's like Philadelphia it's next year. Philly. Yeah. That's, that's where well, we're from. We're, we're from Allentown, PA. We're 50 miles from Philly. Exactly. So it would be perfect to go there, you know? Yeah, you're hearing so this, hoping. Vince. Are you hearing this, Vince? Yeah, man? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of guys. There's cactus. There's, there's uh Booker T, uh a lot of a lot of the guys that are there now that are saying, you know, hey, you need to put the nasty boys in. So you got a lot of the guys that are there now, and uh, you know, even Hulkster said something to me about it. So, you know, I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, you know, um, hey man, I think it's about our time, especially before I die. Please don't put me <laughs> in after I'm dead. No, Dude, you won't have the you, you won't have the speech I gave at the Cauliflower Alley at everybody in stitches. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I was throwing comedy out there and giving it over to Sags. If you ever get a chance to watch it, it's out there. It's uh was our acceptance speech at the Cauliflower Alley Awards. It's uh, pretty funny. Right. Well, people need to hum that out, but it should be on YouTube. I'll give you a couple more, and then we'll move on to the rest of the thing. Uh, okay. Biggest ladies man, and also who had the lowest standards. <laughs> no comment on that one. All right, I will move on. <laughs> yeah, no comment. I'm not getting nobody in trouble. <laughs> uh, loudest. Well, hey, I tell you, Marty was a big ladies' man. You see, you're not the first person to say that. Al Snow went. You, you he was beating him off with a stick, Marty. Yeah, Jeanette. Yeah, I don't know. They they love Marty. He they are. Uh, he, he he was uh, he. And he's still not married, so. <laughs> he's still, well, he's, he's living his best yeah. life then still. Uh, yeah, yeah. Loudest spot caller. Loudest spot caller. Yeah. You know what? Um, I don't know about that one because when you worked with some of the guys, it was like a, a tit for a tat. You know what I mean? Like you knew what they were doing, so you didn't have to – we call a lot of stuff. You call a couple of stuff out there, but when you knew how to wrestle somebody, like maybe in the beginning you would you would worry about it, but uh, we never had a problem with that. Nobody really yelled out about spots or anything. You know, it was really it was really kayfabe back our day. Uh, there, uh, kayfabe was really in effect. I mean, if you were caught, I mean, you look what happened with the Duggan and the Sheik. Mm. You know what I mean? That was that was a big that was a big deal there. You know, so. It was real strict that you you couldn't you know you, you weren't really supposed to ride with the the baby faces or anything you know that that was that was a that was really held at a high standard you know hey, but now nowadays it's not really held as high you know it's it's not that was that was one of the main things back in the eighties and nineties that that kayfabe was one of the biggest things you know like hey you know you're wrestling this guy or you're you know you, you we don't want hanging with them we don't want you doing anything with them and all that stuff so. What year did that change? When, you know, it wasn't like a big deal to ride with the people you were wrestling against. I think after uh, Vince came out after the, the lawsuit and all that, remember, and then he came out and said it was only entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 93, 94. And then after he came out and said, you know, it was only oh, entertainment. Oh, you mean the steroid, the a, steroid trial? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, think yeah. I think that that's the one, that's when that's when it started leaning up. When Right after, you know, Vince himself said, hey, this is entertainment. You know, because mm -hmm. before he would never say that. I've got two more for you. Then we'll move on to some All fan right. questions. Uh, All right. This is the easiest one that everyone will have. Most legit tough badass. What's that? Uh, most legitimate tough badass. Well, you got a couple of them. You got Haku, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you got, uh, uh, let's see, Jimmy Schnooker was one. Um, but put it this way, any of the Samoans were right there. Um, who else? Uh, Sags is in there. Uh, you know, he's, he's he was pretty. He could fight pretty good. So he was he was he was a legit badass. Uh, let's see. 
I'm missing a couple people who are now in my, on top of my head. I was just thinking about this the other day, but uh, oh, uh, Rick, Rick Rude, Nails, another another big another, another tough guy that you didn't want to mess with. Uh, uh, let's see who. I'm trying to shut my phone off here. Okay, sorry about that. No uh, anyway, uh, um, let's see. I'm missing. I'm missing some people because. Oh, Hawk. Got to put Hawk in there. You know, uh, yeah, Hawk was a hell of a, a fighter too. You don't want to you don't want to fuck with Hawk. Um There's probably a few more I'm missing that I don't don't have. I know Rude, Nails, Haku, a uh, Hawk. Uh I put Sags in there. Uh you know that were uh, they were legit. No nobody's good. Jimmy Schnooker like I said. A barbarian. Nobody messes mm -hmm. with Barb either. You know, like I said, you don't mess with the Samoans at all. <laughs> no, but the thing is, everyone seemed to want to mess with Haku. That was the that's the weirdest thing. Like people seem to make a beeline ha to mess with Haku. Well, I never saw that. No, I, I no, I never saw. No, uh, I mean, like people fans. No, no, I'm talking like it because I had Warlord on very recently, and he said he was in the bar once when just a group of like guys in the bar just started crowding him calling him names and you know before that you know before a blink of an eye he'd knocked all four of them out but like people for whatever reason seemed to were they were, were they wrestlers or fans no they i'm not even sure they were fans they were just dudes at the bar they weren't wrestlers oh yeah 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 well that's you, you get that you know yeah <laughs> And put it, put it this way, they picked the wrong the wrong guy to screw with, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then, uh, uh, he's not a wrestler, but Hulk, uh, Hulkster, uh, introduced me to him. But he's a badass, and uh, you might know him. He's an actor too, but he's there with the Hell's Angels and all that. But Chuck Zito, yeah, you know. So I said at at Hulk's uh, birthday party we just had for him, I had Sag there, Haku on the one side. And Chuck Zito on the other. I said, we don't have to worry about no security at this party. <laughs> <laughs> We're covered. <laughs> you hey, know, so. Did you go to the wedding? Uh, no, I did not. It was very private. It was only uh, Nick and his uh, uh, his fiance and uh, Sky and her kids. And, and that's it. It was just a very small, uh, intimate wedding. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you a bit more about Hogan in a tiny bit. But uh, the last question on this sort of giant marathon run of uh, name association stuff is okay. the most memorable backstage fights that you were not involved in. You know, I never really saw no backstage fights. What I saw was I saw <laughs> early on. Uh, uh, Sheik Adnell and Casey's stuff was in the shower, so they were the shower was on all of his stuff. So when Kevin Nails, Kevin Kelly came out, he bought a brand new truck. He had a Dodge Ram, and he used to have that big Ram fan. And Kurt's driving with him, so somebody ripped that hood ornament off. So he drove with Kurt all the way home for four hours, and Kurt was on. Well, Sheik Adnan got his stuff put in the shower, so it must have been Sheik Adnan that ripped your hood ornament off. And Kevin was pissed. So we're already in the interview booth, uh, you know, the interview at AWA. And then, uh, you know, uh, Sheik Adnan comes in with a cup of coffee and he's going ba -da -ba -da 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 to everybody. And Kevin came in about two minutes after with his bags, put his bags down and just started blistering them i mean beating the hell out of him knocked him through the wall and then greg Garner said kevin kevin stop it please there's a lot of expensive equipment around here <laughs> you didn't care about cheek and not he was kidding about that but then after that greg gave up like a 15 minute speech this ribbon stuff gotta stop after he was done with everything kurt hannon had to go Good job, nasty boys. And, <laughs> and, oh, Greg looked right at us. That's it, you guys. And we didn't have nothing to do with it. We didn't have nothing to do with anything. But <laughs> this good old Kurt threw our name under the bus. And <laughs> we were getting scolded and almost fired again. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Memphis, maybe a second time. Hey, do you know what? Just because you mentioned Nails before, there's yeah. a very famous story with Nails. You know what it is when he was a bit upset with his SummerSlam 92 payoff and he went to visit Vince. What happened? You asked Sag that question.
because SAG saw the whole thing. The door was open. Really? But he went in, he went in there asking for more money. And Kurt is the one that stirred that up because he said boss man got paid more than him. And I don't know if that was, it really happened or not. So he wanted his more money because he said boss man got paid this and he only got paid that. And, uh, you know, he picked him up by his throat and threw him down, broke Vince's arm and everything. But ask Sag, because Sag actually saw it. And then Sag yelled, he got him, Sarge. And then Sergeant Slaughter went in there to try to break it up. You know, so. But Kevin didn't leave the building. Kevin went right on the phone, called the cops, said my boss tried to, you know, do something to me there. And and he stayed there till the cops got there. And and there was like an aura around Kevin. Nobody wanted to cope near him or nothing. They were all scared. But, you know, me and Sag went up and we knew him since, you know, we broke into the business. He wasn't even in the business yet when we broke in, you know. So he got in a little bit after. Uh, I always like the old story. So if you're going to confront the boss, you better be prepared to quit. Overpay. <laughs> Oh, he was, he was, he, he did much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So more fan questions. And I know you've okay. told this story a load of times, but right. everyone loves it. Uh, Don C has asked, one of the funniest stories in wrestling lore is Brian's poison gas attack on Elizabeth, a macho man, and getting fined for it too. Could you tell us the story? That was sag, first of all. That was the fart hurt around the world. He's cl- he, right. He's blaming you for that. No, but it wasn't me. It was SAG, but SAG didn't know. We just flew over from uh, the States and we landed in, uh, I think we landed in London. I don't know. If he throw away, but everybody's getting her bags and SAG didn't see Elizabeth behind her, but he picked up his bags. And when he does, Elizabeth was picking up her bag and she was maybe a bag or two behind her, but he, she, SAG left the biggest fart. I mean, like a minute long, and he could have blue dry her hair with the fucking thing. <laughs> I swear. And right away, who jumps on it? But Davey Boy, oh my word. Sag just put it in Elizabeth's face. Oh, that's all we need. Then Macho was going, it's it, Sag's oh my good. And then that's not all that happened. Then when we went out for his limo, Rick thought it was that limo was for him, and he stole Randy's limo. Now Randy's standing on the outside of the airport with no limo. Rick Flair took his limo. <laughs> 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 yeah. So then uh that night uh we went out and it, I no, you know, I think we went from there to Italy and then when we went to Italy, Sag got drunk and and f- passed out in between the damn elevator doors and they were going like this and who comes up just after having dinner with his wife but Randy and it was Sags in the middle of the uh of the door there and then he took the ele- ele- elevator up. So I saw I saw him you know, uh, yelling at Sags that Sags' door was open. I went in there and Sags is like a little kid at the bed and Randy's going back and forth and he's going, it wasn't really you that I'm mad at. Sags is a fucking John Michaels. Da, 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 da. You know, but then we get called in to uh, uh, George Steele's uh, bedroom, you know, and he says, Vince wanted me to have a talk with you because Randy got so mad, he made Vince fly Elizabeth home on the Concord and then fly her back because it was a live sky going on in England, like two days, three days later. So he, you know, we had a flyer back and forth. This, that, and then he said, the sag, uh, Vince McMahon just wants to know, Jerry, that is the most expensive gas you will ever pass. <laughs> and, they, and they took the money out of Sags' check. No. How much, yeah. was that, how much is that running back? I don't know. You got to ask him. Uh, I don't know. They, they, took, they, took, they took it out of Sags' check. Man. But dude, yeah, Concord. it was called the fart. It was called the fart heard around the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So I need to ask you about nails. I need to ask you about the fart heard, heard around the world. Okay. Uh, 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 next one. Uh, do you know what? Because this might actually be the same answer. But what is your crazy story in the UK or Europe? Or was it always like every single time you came over here, it was just like total bedlam, all the rules out the window kind of thing? Uh, well, well, no. But the, the the one of the craziest times we had over there was. Uh, we had so many. I mean, I, I threw uh, Ric Flair's shoes at the Spring Fellows across the bar. I said, are these these $2,000 shoes? Because he was bragging. I took them and whipped them, and the, and the bar was packed. I just took his shoes and threw his $3,000 alligator loafers across the bar. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then uh, 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 there was also uh, 
what else did it happen to him on one of the tours? Oh, geez. I mean, that, we had so many good times. Oh, Wimley. Sag uh, was late to get on the bus, and he didn't want to get on the bus. He said, just go, you know, this and that. So we all got on the bus, and we weren't getting used. To, we were the first match at WrestleMania with uh, me, Sag, and Amount against the Bushwhackers and Hacksaw. Mm. Yeah, SummerSlam. So they were worried SummerSlam, about, not WrestleMania. Yeah, Sum, yeah. SummerSlam, ni- oh, sorry, SummerSlam 92. Mm. And uh, they were, uh, you know, we had the first match, so they were more worried about the other matches, and Kurt didn't have nothing to do with Mr. Perfect. So, uh, I, I mean, that Kurt, Mr. Perfect is Kurt. I mean, Shawn Michaels, Kurt, and me. So we got in there, and there was nothing for us to do. So, you know, Kurt, let's go up on the top of Wembley, the the city, the, the town up there, and we went up there and drank. And then when we came back, we had a good, we were feeling good, this and that. And there was Sag in the corner, and he was getting screamed at by Vince. Who do you think you are? You didn't get on the bus. Da, 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 da. And then Kurt was making faces behind him. And you know, the same thing Kurt did when we were getting fired from <laughs> AWA from Law and that, because he came up to the side and the window was open while we were getting fired. And we're sitting there like puppy dogs going, we're getting fired now from AWA. He's making faces and making fun of us. You know, that that was our mentor, good old Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennig. But <laughs> yeah, we had a good time. And then when we came back in, he Sag was getting yelled at by Vince because he didn't get on the bus. You know, he took a cab over, but he was late, you know. So, oh, yeah, that was funny. Hey, um, that was, that was still a, one of the greatest matches because nobody did nothing. Remember, your first match, it even wasn't on the pay-per-view, but it's on the, the, the DVD or the, the cassette, but we were the first match. Nobody did nothing yet. I mean, the people from England were yelling USA with Hacksaw, you know. I find that I still find that unbelievable, that, that, that and, Hacksaw and, was so over that you could get the English yeah. fans to chant USA. Yeah, and then you had the Bushwhackers, who the people loved anyway, and we had a fantastic match. We went about 10, 12 minutes, and nobody had did nothing yet, so the people were waiting. And the first week we blew it away, man. We had a we had a great match. We were all pumped up, and I was one of I was one of the most memorable besides WrestleMania. That was another most memorable one of the matches in my life. Yeah, you know, with them, um, I interviewed Bushwhacker Luke some time ago, and you know he's been in the business centuries. God, sixty Luke has. years, I think. Yeah, sixty years, yeah. something crazy, and he still holds that as maybe his most special moment ever. So I mean, that really yeah. speaks to it. I mean, is that the same yeah. for you? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is, it, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of different matches that are out there. I can't just pick one, but, uh, definitely one of the favorites are, uh, you know, the, when we won the titles, uh, in WrestleMania seven and Bret Hart even says to me and SAG, that's one of his favorite matches ever, you know? Uh, and I, I was like, you know, that to me, Bret saying that to us, you know, uh, it was is pretty awesome, you know, and it was a good match. If you look back at it, it was we've had all kind of stuff going on in there, you know, and uh, you know that's when Jimmy came out with the helmet and all that stuff. But there were, all the actors were in the front and stuff. It was off. Funny story. I was just at the Boston Comic Con uh, two months, three months ago, right? And I'm there with this guy. He has the cool zoo, so he has animals there. So he had me with him, and then he had the guests over there and. Uh, Henry Winkler, the Fonz, came over to see me and to see how I was doing because he was sitting in the first or second row with Colleen McCoughlin for WrestleMania 7. And he came over to me to ask how I was doing, how my wrestling's doing. And I thought that was pretty cool. After all them years, I haven't seen him since 1991. And he came over to me and over to my where I was sitting and asked me questions. We took a picture together and all that stuff. And we talked for about 20 minutes. And I thought that was awesome mm. that he still remembered me and all that stuff so yeah i remember uh, i remember because that was like the first tape i had pretty much so it was henry winkler macaulay culkin donald trump yeah. i think was there yeah yeah was donald Luf- trump was Lou there Ferino, i think he was there uh, uh, yeah and then you had uh regis filman was yep. at, at one of the announcers they had the guy from jeopardy he was in there and willie nelson Marlon- was there well willie is my friend so i known him since 88 so that night after wrestlemania uh, I took a bunch of the boys and he was staying at Santa Monica Holiday and they were remodeling it. And Kurt's dad, the axe, was giving Kurt crap and saying, <laughs> this guy don't know Willie Nelson. Da, 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 da. And Willie was doing business upstairs. Finally, Willie came down and we had the greatest time. He sang Angel Flying Too Close to the Ground. I said, if you sing that, 
without no music. He sang it. It was great. I said, I'll give you the belt. And I gave him the belt. The bar closed. And then we went to Willie's bus and we took all the wrestlers on the bus. And we, I guess we destroyed the bus a little bit. But uh, the, the bad thing was that at the end of the night, I go, Willie, I, I need that belt back. I need it for tomorrow's TV. So I was like an Indian giver. I gave him because he was wearing the thing like a country belt buckle. He loved it. I got pictures of that <laughs> and everything. But I had him in an airplane spin. He had this thing that said, screw you. It was like the last final word. I said, you play, hit that one more time. I'm going to put you in an airplane spin. He hit it. I had old Willie Nelson at 60 in an airplane spin in the middle of the lounge bar at the Holiday Inn. And his, uh, his security and his bus driver, Gator and LG, were going, put him down, Nobs. You're going to hurt him. Put him down. But uh, Dusty passed the torch to us. In 88, when me, him, and Dustin, me, Sag, and Dustin went to meet him in, in uh, Clearwater, Florida. And after that, he got a like, he took a liking to me, gave me his number, and we've been friends ever since. There you go. You know? Has he still got the tag title, or did he get, did he get he, it back? Uh, he, he, uh, no, he had to give it back. I needed it the next day, you know, so he gave it back. <laughs> and I did. That was one of the uh, uh, presents I gave Hulk. I had, uh, on days known as I had Willie sing him, uh, uh, you know, happy birthday for his mm -hmm. 70th. And then afterwards, he goes, Hulk Hogan, the big 7 0, that ain't shit. Cause he just turned 90. <laughs> so I finally had somebody giving Hulk shit. And Hulk, Hulk Hogan gives me shit. Wait till you turn 70, cause I turned 60 and I'm always complaining. So, you know. <laughs> hey, you, you, you know, the really famous uh, quote by Willie Nelson is uh, something about youngsters. Uh, the youngsters out there really need to think about the world they're going to be leaving to me and Keith Richards. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great quote. That I love that. Well, well, well you know what? He, he told me, you "Slow down, you go down," and he's still out there doing 130 days a year at at 90 years old. So, uh, he is he is a true icon and, and a, a really good, uh, very nice man. Uh, and I'm glad I met him, honored, and a bit friend of his. And for him to do that for me in one day without going through a publicist and all that was amazing. That means he's still out there and he still loves me. So that, I was really honored that he did that. You know, we were, and he texted me the next day to see how Hulk liked it. Did okay. Hulk like it? Yeah, he texted me the next day. I said Hulk loved it. So, you know. And I loved it that he said that at the end because he gave Hulk a little jab because Hulk always gives me them jabs because he's older than me by 10 years. <laughs> Sorry, you caught me just having a quick sip then. That's, that's just, all right. Just before we uh, get off SummerSlam 92, there's one more story that's sort of like shrouded in law. Where did Road Warrior Hawk disappear to after that event? The Hells Angels uh, bar. Uh, the Hells Angels club. Him and Nord. Mm-hmm. And then, they, and then they quit after that. They uh, they were at Raw and they called uh, Hell's Angels Bar in <laughs> London and said, "We quit." Him and Nord, John Nord, they were they're both you know from Minnesota together. They both know each other for years, and yeah, that's uh, I'm sure that's when it happened. That was the, that was the time it happened. <laughs> Did you, is that what you heard? Well, but I've heard two things. Right. So the one is that he uh, went sort of stir crazy when they gave him you know that ventriloquist dummy to like be a mascot for their team yeah and just like hawk it just like bent his head he hated it and then the second one that was in, after SummerSlam, though he uh they wrestled they wrestled uh for the belts they I wrestled know. typhoon in them so this was this was 92 when 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 he went off he went off with the, the hell's angels that's when he quit after that yeah he um oh, he, he drove I, he drove a motorcycle down so the other story is he drove a motorcycle down, him, Ellering, animal. And he hadn't realized, for one reason or another, is that his leg was like on the exhaust or something like that, and he burnt his leg like all completely up, and then he still wrestled because he had no idea. Yeah, well, yeah, I I did the same thing when Hulk and him took us to, when we were in Sturgis and <laughs> took us out to Deadwood and told us we didn't need no shorts or anything, it was freezing, and I burned my leg on that pipe too and i still got the mark from it and and Jeez. that's a yeah it's a nasty nasty burn you don't really know till after you know, especially when you're pumped up and you're going out to wrestle in front of ninety four thousand. i'm sure hawk was just thinking about the match and thinking about you know wrestling and you don't really know till after you know what i mean mm -hmm. so but yeah they came out on cycles and i'm pretty sure that was the time he went he went him and Nord went to the hell's angels clubhouse and that's where they were that's where they called vince from you know <laughs> Right, I've uh, I've, got, 
Hawk, Hawk would always say, you'd ask him what he's doing, he would say, anything I want. I said, okay, Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, with Hawk, I don't think he gets enough credit for being a really creative dude as well, because he's come up no. with a couple of... Like his pretty inter- timely. His interviews were awesome. Yeah, and and, he, and even even in his wrestling, he was he was good. Now now Joe, I love him to death, but I always had Joe, so it was okay. I'm gonna press slam me into the third row, and then I'm gonna come out and press slam me and throw you back in the ring, and then I'm gonna go p- p- uh, power slam you here, and then I'm gonna power this and power that. Okay, Joe, whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Sag was always with Hawk with his spot, so you know. So I had it a little bit easier because Hawk, you know, would work with you, and the heat was always usually on Hawk. You know, I, Hawk always missed and hit the hit the corner. That was his major spot. You know, the guy moved and then he hit the corner and they go all the way through. Mm. He was good at that spot. You know, with uh, with that being said, right. So <clears throat> as I said, I interviewed Warlord recently, and he said, "Do you know what the Road Warriors really like wrestling Warlord and Barbarian because they were finally like finally someone bigger than us." So we can be sort of fighting from underneath, kind of thing. Did the Road right. Warriors do the same things with uh, with you as well, to a point? Because you know you were at least taller, and you know you no, could we, believe we had, we had great matches. We never had a, we never had a problem with them. We we had really great matches with them. I don't even think we had a bad match with them. Really, I mean, because we were used to it. We wrestled the Steiners, you know. We you know, I mean, and and going through the. Uh, you know, we wrestled Power and Glory at the time, and, and you know, going through some of these teams, you know, we you know we were getting we were getting stiffed a lot, and because we were young, the young guys, but we were used to it. So you know, uh, you know, it, you learn along the way. Like like I said, the British Bulldogs taught us. I mean, how about that? That tag team tournament we were on in '88 had uh, Stan Hansen uh, with uh, uh, Tenru. And then it had uh, Abby and uh, Tiger Jet Singh. Then it had Terry Gordy and Bill Irwin. Then it had uh, Crawford and uh, uh, his his uh, his partner from Canada. Mm. Um, uh, the can what were they called? I oh, forget. But the, uh, uh, Furnace yeah, they were on. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, Furnace. Yeah. yeah, and and they were very good. And I someone just sent me a match of them, and I forgot how you know how good of matches we had with them guys. But that was that was a tour that really you know you know wrestling guys like Terry Gordy and stuff. I mean that that all helped us in the in the long run because we were only in the business at three three years at that time. Mm. We went over to Giant. We went over. That was the only time we worked for uh, Giant Baba. Then the rest of the time we went to Anoki After that, good payoff, man, Baba. What's that? Good payoff. Bob, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. Yeah. All, but both of them were working in Japan was always a dream, you know. And we got over there too, you know, because they liked our style. They liked that kind of, you know, rough and 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 crazy style. And when we went over there. I mean, look at Stan Hansen and him, you know. I didn't know you could just go out there, but at that time, uh, Japanese people couldn't sue, so. You know, if you hit somebody, you weren't getting sued. You know what I mean? They were they were going through the middle of the crowd just knocking people over. Mm-hmm. Like I said, well, hardcore, yeah, that's kind of our thing. But you look back and and uh Bruiser Brody was doing it way back then. So was Terry Funk. You know, they were they you know, they're the they're the real true kings of hardcore. And them are the guys that, you know, were doing this stuff before anything we ever called. I mean, Brody was using chairs and all that stuff back in the day, and and uh and and so was Terry Funk. You know, did anyone? And, and 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 what's his name? Uh, Stan Hansen wasn't too. You know, he had that cowbell. He was he was whipping people with that thing, with that big ass strope. You know, so while while and we wrestled them you. too. <laughs> yeah, and and Tenru was no lightweight either. He he was stiff as hell. You know, but we wrestled all them guys. You know, it was a tag team tournament. We were over there for four weeks. Did any of the young boys try and test you? Uh, some of the Japanese young boys tried to test us and. That didn't work too well for them. <laughs> and, and that got around, you know. <laughs> so, but that's what you've got to do, yeah. isn't it? So like 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 the young yeah, boys back in the day, they're trying to make a name the for themselves. Day, I don't know. I don't know how it is now, but back in the day, you did. You know, we came over there and you know, you know you're gonna get, you know, uh some some kind of different uh people trying to maybe knock you down or stuff, and you gotta be prepared and ready to go. So we were always ready to go for every match there. You know, because it was way different than wrestling over here. You know, they don't they didn't even really cheer. You know, they clapped a couple of times and you know, it wasn't like the crowds are over here or over in Europe. 
I used to love wrestling over in Europe because, you know, with the horn, da, 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 you know, you guys were always pumped up. And, and you, you, when you're a wrestler, you like to feel that it gives you more adrenaline. And, you, you, you know, even if you're a bad guy, you know, you're doing your job. You know, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, the old did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. Yeah, Nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I remember him. I remember. Him. Um, this next fella has asked, Monkey Gone to Hell, why did the Nasty Boys leave the WWF in 1993? Well, that's because, uh, you know, after the WrestleMania 9 thing, and then uh, our attitudes kind of went downhill a little bit because they weren't really doing anything with us. So, you know, and then we had a talk and, uh, you know, we went through a little time there with, we had, we went back and forth with Vince and I said, well, you know, we had a meeting at his office and we said, well, you know, if you want to give us our release and, and you know, we'll, we'll try down, you know, go down to WCW. And, uh, you know, he ended up giving us a release. We were the last ones to get our release with our name and he he left us go and, and we already had Dusty already lined up because Dusty was booking down there and he wanted to bring us down there. So, you know, we went right down there and we won the belts down there. That was the first time we, you know, won the belts. And then we won it two more times. We won three times. We won uh, WCW titles three times, the world titles. But we were supposed to win the WWF ones, you know, the second time. And then we got screwed. And then after that, our, our attitudes changed a little bit. <laughs> now, maybe it shouldn't have, but... You know, at the end, when it happened, this like that, it kind of pissed us off a little bit, you know? Yeah, because I remember, you, you know, this is more or less when I started watching, and I, like, between 92 and 93, it seems like pretty much every established name from the 80s and 90s had disappeared completely. And it was, I mean, with a couple of exceptions, you know, like Brett, Shawn Michaels, Undertaker. But yeah. everyone else just seemed to get wiped out. And, uh, you know, everyone's got their theories. Obviously, you know, the drug testing starts coming in, the steroid testing starts coming in, the federal government's looking at them more closely, that kind of thing, so they have to sort of be squeaky clean. We didn't, we didn't have to worry about the steroid well, thing. Uh, well, all, that was one of the things it, I was going to ask. It, 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 was, it was all the other shit. <laughs> 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 it just didn't test for steroids, so, you know. But, uh, you know, weed, you got busted, uh, then $1,000 the first time, and 3000 and 5000 and the fourth time, then you get uh, six weeks off, with pay, I guess, or something like that. Uh, I guess that's the way, way they put it. And then I forgot what they did with the, if they did the same with the steroids. We never had to worry about the steroids because we were big guys. We never, you know, I, I actually took them back in, I don't know what, maybe late 80s. And Davey Boy asked me what program I'm on. And I said, program? He goes, yeah, what, what, what are you doing working out? I said, Oh, you got to work out with these things. I thought I could just take it and I'd be looking like Hulkster and Ultimate War in about three months, but no, you actually have to work out with them. I said, Well, I guess I'm not doing that stuff no more because <laughs> we weren't, we weren't one, we were with the cover up, we were one, we weren't the big get to the gym people, you know, as you as you can wear, we all know, you know. Do you know, amazingly, Dutch Mantel's told me the same thing. So I do a weekly show with Dutch Mantel, and he said, I took steroids briefly when I went to WCW, but no one told me I had to work out with him, I just got fat. Yeah, <laughs> that was the same with me. I just, I just, I thought I would just get, you know, the I get pumped up and getting in there. Just but, like, uh, you just dealt with yeah. the swelling, like, <laughs> like yeah, to... right, exactly. But uh, well, we we got our we got our workouts in after you know after we knew what we had to do to just stay in shape and that. But uh, yeah, but in the early rounds, you know, it didn't do anything. So yeah, we we, we never that was. Nah, it's steroids. Yeah. We just didn't have to do them. We're, we're both big guys. Sag six four. I'm almost six three, and and we we were always big guys back in the day. You know, so mm. you know. Uh, also, with you leaving in 1993, uh, I was also told this recently that as soon as the World Bodybuilding Federation started coming in, then everybody's paycheck started getting whittled. Well, that's the true. Yeah, that was that was that was a that was a little problem there, you know, because. Uh, he was taking. I, I he might. Have, I don't know if he was taking money from there to pay them, but but our payoffs were getting a little bit. You know, we we're, were they're still we were still selling out, but the the payoffs were getting pretty. You know, kind of lower where it shouldn't have been lower. So who knows? You know, that's all. That's all stuff I don't know about. I mean, but that's that's all stuff you hear, just like you heard it. Yeah, we heard the same thing. So we don't know if it was true or not, but you never know. You know, business is business. Yep. 
Uh, I'm going to pff, I'm going to skip so much. We're actually going to go to like the mid 2000s here. Then we're going to do the final game. Then I will thank you so much for your time. Okay. Uh, Raymond Reynolds Jr. asks: Was Nobbs using a script on Hogan Knows Best, or is he just that crazy in a good way? <laughs> I'm just that crazy in a good way. There was never no script. They kind of told you like what they were looking for, but then they just like say, "Hey, this is what we're trying to get out of this this show," and then. They would just let us roll with it. I mean, we didn't need no script or anything. Mm. And in that time, I took my, you know, he got me in that stupid dance when Brooke knows best. We went up for spring break and uh, he uh, said, you know, hey, I'm going to put you in that contest with these 20 year old guys that are all ripped up and that I'm, I have a big fat gut and, you know, I look like crap. And I said, I'm not getting up there and dancing around like that. And then he winked at the producer, you know, he went, he went like, he went, he went, I'm going, ah, what are you, what are you, what are you winking at him for? I said, I'm not, I'm not doing it. No matter what you say, I'm not, I'm not going to, and, and then he winked at the guy again. I, goes, I don't know why you're winking at him. And all of a sudden, 17 shots of Patron later, I went up there and <laughs> did some kind of funky dance. I don't even know what the hell I did. Pulled my drawers down and everything. My mom's seen the damn program. So that didn't get too favorable back home. What are you ripping down your bad foot? <laughs> but it was one of the funniest ones. I get that all the time. You, go, you were the funniest guy on the show. I, th I, said, I think they had me on it for the comic relief. But no, it was all, that was all me. There was no script. Nobody told me to do that stuff. I was just me being me. You is, know? It, is it good and payoff? The first couple, I didn't even get paid because I was on disability. And, and my knee was you know, wrecked. So uh, the first couple I did, I was doing them for free. I didn't even know, you know. Well, I didn't even know how big the show was going to get, you know. So that was that was that was crazy. Well, but I miss it. That, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. So, like, I, I would have thought that like the payoff was going to be really good. You know, it's a big MTV show. Yeah, and you didn't even not yeah, at first. No, no, not at first. But then I did. I took a, took a couple of years, two two years maybe, two three years. I don't think they still replay it, do they? But I mean, if they did, would you get royalties from it? No. No, hell no. Oh, really? But I, I think it's on YouTube and stuff because people still send me, like, clips. But I, I saw, like, some guy had me sign something yesterday, and it was a box. They they must have came out with a whole set of DVDs. That that was a while back. But, no, I didn't get nothing off that. That was, no. I got paid for what I did, and that was it, you know. But it was good. I had fun. It was always it was always a fun time. Hmm. You know, if you're having fun, why, why, why quit, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just, I, I have to, I can't, I am going to skip the story, but I had Val Venus on not too long ago. He told us no. a story on the Hulkamania <laughs> tour where you really wanted a kid's hot dog. Um, but we don't have time to tell it, unfortunately. I'd love to tell it, but we're going to have oh, to. Oh, I wanted the kid's hot dog. Take a bite. <laughs> he didn't even know who it was. And the little kid came back with a smart ass answer. He's like, I didn't shove that hot dog up his ass. But they were <laughs> laughing. Him and Godfather were laughing at me because the kids it wouldn't give me a bite of his hot dog. I was starving. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, one day we're gonna have to get through that, you know, a part two. Uh, that, a part that, two that, 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 whole, that that whole tour though, that was one of the best tours we were ever on because it was run by Rikishi and Hulk. And he didn't have Vince or WCW running, so they let us do what we did. And and all the all four four nights, it was successful. That all the shows sold out, and mm -hmm. it was a great time. And with good friends too, you know. Uh, I'm going to, do you know, just before we get to the final bit, very very quickly, uh, Ultimate Wrestling Gaming asks asks, who do you think is the greatest tag team of all time? But I'm going to add on to that. If there was a wrestling tag team, Mount Rushmore, of teams that you faced, who would be the four teams on that? Oh, my word. Well, Road Warriors right away. Mm. Um, I put the Steiners up there. God, Harlem Heat. Um, That's right. Geez, I mean, the British Bulldogs. I mean, there's so many. I mean, I can think even back when I, before I was wrestling, who I was watching, you know, like uh, Zabisco and Tony Gurria and stuff like that. So, uh, but, uh, you know, the guys that we wrestled, I'd have to put, you know, Hard Foundation, LOD, Steiners, Harlem Heat, Public Enemy, um, British Bulldogs. I mean, can't keep forgetting them. 
And we didn't. The only time we really wrestled them though was in Japan. But it was a, such a you know, four weeks. We were with them and we wrestled them a lot. So it was a very uh, uh, learning experience for us, and it taught us a lot. So that meant a lot, you know, and especially from Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy. So, and then like I said, and we also wrestled uh, Davy Boy and Sting, and you know, there's just teams that were put together. But uh, but them are them are about tops right there. You know, you go. Um, uh, LOD and you told Heart Foundation, you know, Harlem Heat and Steiners and and Public Enemy and uh, you know, and British Bulldogs and you know, oh man, I'm I'm missing so many, but uh, that's about them. Them are about the, the 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 big ones there. But the Road Warriors really changed the game a lot in the wrestling business because they were coming in and just smashing people and beating them in two minutes. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever did that before. You know what I mean? So they were a different kind of, you know, everybody was, you know, look at them. You know what I mean? So and they were the real deal. So Midnight Rockers. I think we got to about 10. Oh, I forgot the Rockers. Oh, no, you got to put the Rockers in there, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to. I mean, really, no, because they, 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 they helped train us and all that. You know, I even forgot about Marty and Sean. You know what I mean? It it's was it's like, an unfair uh, question, isn't it, to be perfectly honest? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's it's hard for us because we wrestled so many great teams. You, you know, we can't just pick one and say, oh, this this is the only one. And that's hard to do. You know what I mean? Because we had great matches with all of them teams. We had great matches with the Midnight Rockers. We had great matches with the Rockers. We had great matches with the uh, uh, British Bulldogs. We had great matches with the, the Harlem, uh, the Hart Foundation, the Steiners. We had great uh, matches with the Road Warriors, mm -hmm. uh, Harlem Heat. And Harlem Heat was young at the time when we wrestled them. We, we helped teach them guys, even Public Enemy. We helped them bring them around, and we had great matches with them. So everybody we ever got against, uh, the only ones that me and Sag always said were like a hard team to wrestle were like uh, Typhoon and Earthquake because they were big guys. So we had to work around them because – they couldn't do everything, you know. Earthquake could. Earthquake could do a lot. He was really good, but, but you know, that, them are the teams we had to look at different angles of how to how to wrestle so you know, it would be easier, a little bit better because they're you know they're so massive. It's hard to do stuff with massive guys. You got to work work around them because just like if you work with Andre or someone big like that, you you have to uh, you know think about what their size and what they do, and you know you got to you got to change your style to their style, and that's what we learned along the way how to change styles. We could wrestle, we could street fight, we could do we could do it all, you know, because we were taught that way. So uh, you know, and that's how we became, you know where we are today and you know thank god you know we're both still here and we're both still here to tell stories and and uh you know uh catch one of my comedy acts uh because it's called believe it or not you know brian knobs famous and broke and uh you know uh i tell it all there because this way nobody can come back and hit me up because it's a comedy show mm -hmm. hey believe it or not is it real is it not you know says because you don't want to throw nobody under the bus there's a lot of people that like to do that and that's something me and Sag never were born with. We we're from uh, Pennsylvania, and we we're blue collar guys. And um, you know, we're, we're we're there to we're we're a big fraternity of brothers, just wrestling, pro wrestling, and we have to watch each other's back all the time, just like football does, just like baseball does, just like you know any any sporting soccer. You know, there's 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 a there's a if you're in the league and you're in the league a, a long enough time. You get the respect from from the other from the other uh, you know your players or teammates or whatever, and even other. It's so funny that other uh, sport sports always want to get into wrestling. You know, football players want to be wrestlers, or baseball players they always want. Everyone wants to get in, even the, even the singers. You know, yeah. you know Snoop Dogg's in there. You know, so so wrestling is uh, by far the universal uh, sport there is. You know, so yeah, absolutely. But it hurts. I'm hey. I got a cane over here and that's after uh, almost 40 years of doing this stuff. So uh, you can say it, what it is, fake, whatever you want to call it, but it ain't as fake as you think because we all are beat up here, you know? So especially the older time wrestlers that, you know, went through this stuff, the back injuries and the knees and plus everything else. But uh, all everybody seems to have a good, good attitude. You know, when I talk to everybody, everybody seems to be, in, in a good 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 space and uh not not too many uh grumpy uh 
you know, I know you podcast a lot of people, so you know who's who's nice. And some some guys can be real, you know, jackasses. Oh, but, dude, uh, pretty much everyone's yeah. nice. Pretty yeah, much everyone's yeah. easy to deal with. Yeah. I mean, I can count on one yeah. hand, you know, the yeah. the yeah, people that, I didn't have a good experience. Me too. With. That's what I say. Yep. Yeah. Same same thing. You know. So I will. Um. In we've got about fifteen minutes or something like that left in the interview. All so right. with our last game. Uh, it's the one I do with everybody. That's me. I also do the other one with everybody as well. It's called Firing Line, and essentially it's just a reversive name association. I'm going to give you right. a person's name, and you, you know, you, if you tell me to move on or whatever, but I'm sure you'll say that everyone's great that I, that I give you a name of. And the very first one is Kerry Von Eric. Awesome. Yeah, good, good guy. Um, you know, they put him through a, a lot when because he did a lot of the uh, with the. Uh, uh, sick kids and stuff like that, and you know, and he did that a lot, and and you know, you don't never know, you know. I mean, after doing all, do it for a long time, you never know how it gets to somebody or whatever. But he was such a nice guy. He was a he was a sweetheart. He really was. He was a, he was a really good guy, and would always try to go to help you out in the ring if he saw something or he thought you should, should do something or stuff stuff like that. But Kerry was Kerry was great. Next one's bad company. Bad company or good guys. Uh, uh, Pat Tanaka, is, he was our first one that took us in, and we lived. He had us come live at his house in Tennessee, and there was not one piece of furniture in there. It was just <laughs> an empty. It was an empty house. We, we slept on the on the carpet floor. I said, "What the hell? You don't even have no furniture in there." Well, I just got the place. Well, at least put a damn couch or something and they don't even have a tv and and paul paul was a good guy but he wasn't with the he wasn't with the gang usually he usually was off and did his own little thing i don't know what he did but you know he wasn't he wasn't as close as pat was lex luger lex is a good guy yeah yeah we we uh we put lex to uh the mill a couple times go on you know because he was uh, yeah because he was the the total package in that we had always still ribs at him. You know, we just saw him not too long ago. Uh I actually we saw him uh last week. So but he's doing good. He's doing better now. And uh uh but he's he's one of the guys that we grew up with. So he's always gonna be one of them uh close friendship guys. Him and Sting, you know, and the Steiners and you know the the, the group of guys there in WCW when we first came in. Uh we were all about the same age and all about same time getting in, so uh, we all it all worked together. It all worked good. Steve Kern. Steve Kern's great. He's uh, he's a mentor of ours, and he's still pulling jokes on me and stuff like that. So, you know, he'll never change, and uh, I love him to death. And he's he's uh, he'll never. I I just tell him if your grandkids grow up like you you mentored us, they're going to be monsters. Because the way you, you know, because he, he was, he was one of the biggest, him and Kern were one of, uh, him and uh, Kurt were one of the biggest ribbers back in the day. Mm. They would do some serious ribs, you know. The Sandman. Uh, Sandman's good. He, you know, we had, we had a good time. I, I don't know him that very well, but I did. I wrestled. It was so funny. I wrestled him the first time and uh, it was in uh, Nitro. And that was my first time back in Nitro. And uh, he said to me, <laughs> after I, we were done, I hit him. And he came in and he was yelling. And he goes, Jesus Christmas knobs. Man, you hit me here and hit me there. It's a work. And I looked at him in, in front of all the boys and I said, and you're supposed to be the king of hardcore. And then everybody started laughing. He kind of got embarrassed and walked out of the locker room. But, <laughs> no. but we're, we're, we're still friends. He still likes me. I still like him. He's a good guy, you know. <laughs> I'm going to give you another uh, WCW one from later on. La Parker. La Parker was good. I, I I didn't know him as good as Psychosis and uh, um, what's his name? Hoovy. Uh, Hoovy, yeah. I didn't know. Hoovy I knew really good. Ray, Ray Mysterio knew great. We knew Conan, but Leparco we didn't really uh uh know too good. You know, we you know, I don't know, don't know if I ever wrestled him or not. I don't remember if I did or not, but no, I I, I didn't really uh you know com uh, conversate with him too much. But uh the other guys I did, you know, Hoovy and 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 uh Ray and uh you know uh, uh 
psychosis. You know, they were all, they, they all would come around. Yeah, we, we would all go out and have a couple of drinks together and stuff like that. You weren't there in Australia, were you, when Juventu Guerrero had his freak out? No, I did not. I was only over there once. That was with the Hulkamania tour. I never heard about that. Oh, uh, supposedly someone laced something with PCP. Oh, really? No, yeah. I wasn't there for that. No. I'll move on. Uh, Sid. Sid's a good guy. That that's Sid Udi. We, we, <laughs> we, we used to screw with him too. Well, we drove with him and he used to always have his cooler like full of sandwiches. You know, he had watch what he ate in that. And Sig was always digging in there and goes, Get out of there, boy. That's not your stuff. And then one time we're taking the bags up, and Sag was already up in his room and he had he had Sid's bag and he's up on like the sixth floor and he's hanging it out the window. And Sid sees him. Sid goes, don't you do it, boy. Do it. <laughs> All of a sudden, the bag was dropped. It went, Sid's bag six stories up, boom, into the bushes. <laughs> and another time, we were driving with him. And, uh, and Sag, pulled the, Sag was on the passenger side. Sid was driving. So he did this thing with this hitchhiker. And he said, pull over, Sid. Sag gets out and goes, come on, come on. So when the hitchhiker pulls in, he jumps in the car and goes, drive, Sid, drive. So Sid drives away. Sid thought this was the funniest thing. So later on, I think the next day we're driving, Sags is driving, and Sid's on the passenger side. Sid goes, Sags, let's do that rib again. Pull on the side and I'll get out. All right, and then we do, do the same thing. So Sid gets out and goes, come on, boy. Come on, come on. And it's all he did. Sid turns around and Sag took off with the car. <laughs> Had a hitchhiker's pissed off because he we were gonna pull the rib on him. He's running after Sid. Sid's running after the car, yelling, Sag, you son of a bitch. I'm telling you, slow the car down. So Sag, the door was half open. Sid got one arm on the one side of the other, and he's hopping one leg long. Sag's going about 10 miles an hour, and Sags, Sid can't wait to get back in the car because this, this hitchhiker was running after him full blast. If he would have had him, he might have had a gun on him or whatever. He wanted to kill Sid for doing it. But yeah, we always had, we, we, we always put it this way we ripped everybody from the top on down. So, you know, it didn't, we didn't just pick on the smaller. No guys. discrimination. I mean, no, no discrimination. You know, one time we were in Atlanta airport and Hulk's on one side of the bench, Sag sat on the other side of the bench. And right in the middle of the airport, and, and it was, the middle was open, and Sag so just lifted his fart, but he, he's aiming it at Hulk and left the biggest fart, and Hulk just looked at him like, did you really just do that, just do a big fart? Like, like he was farting on Hulk. Hulk was so pissed <laughs> off. He, he got up, he walked, he walked down one side of the, 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 the terminal to the other side of the terminal, and Sag so goes, what's wrong? I said, well, you fucking fart. It looked like you farted on Hulk. What the hell are you doing? You farted on Elizabeth. Now you farted on Hulk. What, what's with you in the fart and shit? What the hell's going on? You know? <laughs> hey, do you know, I've got to ask just about Sid, and this is going to be the weirdest question I understand. Yeah. There's a rumor going around that at one point Sid had a pet squirrel. Have you ever heard that? No, but believe it or not, my brother Ed has a pet squirrel. You're kidding. <laughs> no, he got it from the outside and he still has it. Jeez. You know? <laughs> But my dad was crazy anyway. You know, he, this is how my dad got got me out of the house. He he got into like being a herpetologist as a hobby, and he put poisonous snakes aside of my bed. I had a rattlesnake on the one side of my head, the cage, and on the other side of my bed was a cobra. Like, really? Mm. I said, Dad, all you had to do was ask me to you know <laughs> leave leave and get a job. You didn't have to start putting poisonous snakes in my room. <laughs> Get me out of the house. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> oh, my uncle's done the exact same thing. Like many years ago, he had a, an yeah. entire room dedicated to about 20 tarantulas. And it's like, if yeah. you don't want me to oh. come around, just, you just tell me. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the only thing I hated. When he got the spiders, he got the poisonous spiders, one as big as a dinner plate that if it bit you, you could die. And I, that's the only thing. Snakes don't bother me at all. But spiders do and he was got the, he had the lizards then he got the spiders and the spiders uh, uh that's uh i'm like you no yeah. tarantula he had tarantulas but he had other ones that were really poisonous and i was like i'm out 
<laughs> that's it. Thanks, Dad. I'm going in the army. <laughs> yeah. What are you supposed to do? Pet them? Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, we've, uh, yeah. I don't know. We've got about five minutes or so left, so we'll speed through uh, as many names as we can. Uh, uh, Paul Orndorff. Great. Great guy. Great man. Good guy. Loved us. Uh, another mentor. Another guy that ta taught us a lot about the business. But yes, thumbs up. Buddy Rose. <laughs> I know you can't be he, quick with Buddy. He, he, he was great. He was he was great. And what an awesome wrestler. I mean, that's not the only thing. It's not just that he was funny on the outside of the ring and the stuff he did. But inside the ring, he knew what he was doing. He knew the psychology. He knew how to wrestle. And he, and he taught us a lot, too, because he was there as the playboys wrestling the rockers you know the midnight rockers at the time when we were there and we learned a lot off them guys too you know but yeah awesome awesome guy alex wright alex is a good guy yeah alex is uh uh you know we used to make fun of him uh, now now he can get back at me because he used to use them uh you know the, the they're called wet wipes kind of you use now and you can flush them well he used to use that back in the day and I said, what the hell? You can't wipe your ass right. You have to use these wet ones. And now, now I'm 60 and I'm using them. So <laughs> now we can get now we can get me back. But we always got on Dust Fun the kid. We 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 liked him. He was he's a he was a good he was a good guy. Medusa. Uh Medusa, she was good. We know her from when before she ever got into wrestling. So mm -hmm. and she was trained by Sherry. So she got trained the right way. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. now she's into a lot of stuff and you gotta give it to her. Then she went from that to monster trucks and 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 uh uh conquered that. So, you know, she got her stuff together and then she's producing now NWA, so she's doing good for herself. I'm proud of her. Rick Martel. Rick, um, yeah, he's he, Another great guy. Yeah, another guy, guy taught us a lot. And, you know, and him and Piper were friends at the time. And, you know, so, uh, you know, we got to know Rick very well. But, uh, you know, we still go back and forth on Facebook. And he asked me different stuff. But but I miss him, man. He's And what a great wrestler he was. Yeah, I think he's I more mean, or less. He, he doesn't do the conventions or anything very much, I don't think. No, so. no, he's he, he's stuck up in he he likes up, up in Quebec City, and he don't he don't he don't he don't go out too much. No, that's Either there's nails, you don't see nails out there. Nails is probably hiding in the woods somewhere. <laughs> you Co know, Coco beware. Coco, you gotta love Coco and Frankie. Come on, <laughs> we wrestled high energy. You know, you, you know, but Coco, Coco is always nice to us. He still is, you know, a very good guy, but he's a Memphis guy. So, you know, the Memphis guys were brought up right and good friends of Jimmy Hart and stuff like that. So, yeah, we, uh, we had always good times with Coco and, and he uh, was always in a good mood. I'm one of the know? toughest dudes as well. So I hear constantly in these interviews, yeah. just to like yeah, a total well, spark plug badass. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard that. You know, he I think he was it he tried to do something I don't know if him and Duggan got into it one time, but but I don't think he would have fared too good against Jim. Mm. You know, yeah, Jim Jim's a pretty tough guy himself there. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll give you a few more. There we go. Uh, I'll right. give you a few more and then I'll wrap it up. Uh okay. so who am I gonna ask you? Jerry Blackwell. Jerry Blackwell, you know what? I never really liked him too much. He was he was kind of standoffish. I don't know why he, he never really, t he didn't like the younger guys. Now, he was old school and never really conversated with us. Never really even said hello, kind of, you know, but we were in Kurt's crew and stuff like that. So anyone that was involved with Kurt and the younger guys and the, you know, Marty and Sean, cause they were pulling most of the ribs, you know, they were, they weren't too well, you know, like they hid Nick Bockwinkel's belt and we got blamed for that too. And then <laughs> they found it in the freezer at the office because he needed to do interviews and they couldn't find it for an hour and then they found it in the freezer. <laughs> and we got blamed for that one too, but we didn't do it. So <laughs> I'll, um, I'm going to give you three more. So if Chris yells at you, uh, then that's uh, that's my fault. Uh, 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 Jesse Ventura. Ah, uh, we like the body. Yeah, we we ribbed him too. <laughs> Ow. But the body, yeah, the body was good. Uh, uh we we took something to. Oh, we took his pass. <laughs> yeah, so we could drive on the lot. You know, because he could drive on a lot. That, <laughs> we took his pass so we could drive on a lot in Disney, you know. 
And they, they, they try to say stuff to us. But uh, he always liked us, though. He always got along, and he always gave us good advice, and especially when we were in the WCW, because he was an announcer down there for, for a long time. And, and he always put us over, and he was always nice to us. Second to last, Matt Bourne. Matt was Krusty the Clown. He was really Krusty the Clown. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was just... <laughs> I, 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 I pulled the rib on him. Because... When we would go eat at these places when we were on the road, he would wait and go eat everybody else's food and wouldn't buy anything. So Sag had a big jar of mayonnaise, like a like it looked like vanilla pudding. And Sag goes, does anybody want this vanilla pudding? Knowing Matt would want it. And Matt goes, I'll take it. And then he goes, do you have a spoon? And Sag goes, no. So he took the whole like big jar and went, uh. And it was mayonnaise. And he was <laughs> spitting it up and gagging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was true crusty the clown he never washed his uniforms or anything you talk about sometimes somebody stinking matt was the one <laughs> he never washed his uniform oh it's a full yeah, body yeah, thing but, as well yeah we, 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 he would he would let it he come home off the road and leave it there and then bring it back on the next road trip and never wash it like what the hell <laughs> very last one greg garnier uh, Greg Gagne, ask Sag that. Greg, Greg, Sag will give you a love letter to Greg Gagne. Greg, Greg's a good guy, but uh, he was the boss's kid. But you know, back in the day, he always treated us like crap because we were young guys and we were always getting yelled at. But uh, you know, he, you know, he was the, the boss's kid and and uh, he got to learn the business. And uh, you know, he, he he was good at what he did, but uh, you know, he was he was kind of stiff with us a lot, you know. So. You know, uh, because we were the young guys there and we were always getting yelled at. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but uh, you could ask Sag about that. He'll put Greg Gagne over big time and then tell, you could tell him, well, uh, your partner said you were going to do that. <laughs> you know, because, yeah. I have just... He didn't even thank me. He didn't even thank me at the, the first uh, International Hall of Fame because he sat with Greg. All he was doing was talking about Greg. I said, why don't you just introduce Greg? You didn't even thank me. I thanked you for being my partner for all these years, and I know him for fifty years. And you didn't even say one thing about me in your whole you know, Hall of Fame speech. All you were talking about was Greg Gagne. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I've just put that on on uh, the other script as well. So Greg Gagne and Nails is going to be on the other script. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. There's a part two. There's a part three. There's a part four here. I absolutely guarantee that if you're coming back. I'll have you back for another marathon session. Before I let you go, have you got any plugs? You've got a T-shirt there you want to show? Oh, well, we got uh, we got shirts on Pro Wrestling Tees. Uh, we're we're going to be doing a, a, a bunch of different stuff coming up. They just got to look out. Uh, if they get me on my Facebook or my Twitter, I usually put everything out there. And uh, just a bunch of different shows. And we're going to be at WrestleCade coming up uh, this year. And uh, we got a couple other uh, dates uh, uh, lined up. And uh, we're just going to keep on going, man. Keep on going and going out there. And I'm starting these comedy shows up now. So if you see me coming around, definitely going to come out. They're definitely entertaining. Uh, I do say a lot more than I do here because I don't want to incriminate myself. But when I'm out there, you know, uh, it's believe it or not, like I said, you know, <laughs> hey, I'm telling I mean, it's a it's a comedy club. It's telling a joke. You know what I mean? What can I say? But uh, thank you for having me on, and I really appreciate it.